Hello. Okay, so last week we played through some of um highway blossoms. That went really well, I thought. I really enjoyed that game. I uh actually continued playing through it after I was done with the stream and I really enjoyed it. So today we're moving on to another game by the same studio. It's called um, Heart of the Woods. And it's in a similar vein of a visual novel featuring Girls Who Like Girls. So, let's get it started up. I don't know if I'll have to uh, narrate again, but if I do... Well, I'll take care of it. Winter Wonderland. That's how this place was pitched to us. Out in the middle of a forest with an unpronounceable name in a village that time forgot. In the email, it sounded like every other ghost hunter's paradise that we get messaged about. Isolated and antiquated, with a tourism board encouraging hokey effects and gaudy billboards. The vast majority of those emails go unanswered. If Terra weren't so capricious, this one probably would have too. But no. Something about journeying to the middle of nowhere for a month struck her fancy. And like always, I let myself get dragged into it. So, here I am, for the last time. The train beats out a slow, monotonous rhythm beneath us. It's an older machine, the sort that looks like it's supposed to take us to wizarding school. Or that should be in a museum. When I bought the tickets, I thought we'd be getting on something a bit more modern. Oops. I shifted my seat, the tattered cushion and wooden boards doing little to soothe the pain in my back. We've been on this train for 12 hours. I can feel every one of them in my bones. Tara's been out for the past six. Upright but fast asleep. If the bumpy ride bothers her, she doesn't show it. The paperback she was reading dangles low in her hands, in danger of losing her spot in the book. I scuff my feet across the floor, kicking at nothing. As tired as I am, I'm afraid for our journey to end, for Tara to wake up, to have to talk to her. I'm almost offended that she can sleep. She should be as preoccupied as I am, fighting off intrusive thoughts and wondering what to say. You wouldn't know from looking at her that we've barely spoken for three days. That's how long ago I told her that this would be our last trip for the show together, that I was quitting once we got back home. Everything since then, packing, booking our tickets, finding someone to take care of the cat while we're gone, happened in a blur. We've been cordial, but that's it. My heart hurts, but it tells me I made the right decision. Yawning, I lean back against my seat and pretend it's comfortable. The cushions are unnoticeable, nearly as firm as the wooden floor beneath us. A heater in the corner hems and haws like an old man. It's not nearly powerful enough to fight off the chill. I desperately wish that I could sleep, too. But one of us needs to be awake when we get to the station, and that should be any minute now. Plus, I've never been able to fall asleep on planes or trains anyway. My eyes are sore, and I rub one of them as I press my cheek to the cold window. 
outside, it may as well be another world compared to the city we left behind. If not for the moonlight, I wouldn't be able to see anything. A soft white glow makes the snow and nearby forest glisten like it's under some sorceress's spell. A winter wonderland. The trees are all bare, save for the blanket of snow that covers them. Their empty branches look like something out of a kid's Halloween movie, shaking the wind as if possessed. They seem to stretch on forever, farther than I can even see. It's more like an ocean than a forest. Morgan certainly wasn't exaggerating when she said this place was remote. Intermittent lights flicker amongst the trees in the distant darkness, which I assume come from either winter campers or hermits. I call them crazy, but I'm about to be in the exact same position. Something catches my eye, way out in the woods, where the trees, barely visible, seems to shake in a different way than the rest, as if blown by a different breeze. A thin layer of frost is beginning to form on the outside of the window as I push my face against it, turning to try and find whatever it was I saw. It's gone, though. It was almost certainly never even there to begin with. Either my eyes were playing tricks on me, or the moonlight was. I sigh and sit back again, allowing my eyes to barely close. I won't fall asleep. I'll just... Just... I'm jostled back into alertness as the train lurches harder than before. There's a shrill whistling sound, and then the shutters of the train go stronger as we begin to slow down. The driver hit the brakes. We're almost there. Across from me, Tara is undisturbed. Somehow, she still hasn't dropped her book. Apparently, she's less clumsy when she's asleep. Through the frosted window, I can see the lights of what must be Eisenfeld as we approach the station. They're few and far between, like scattered stars. The buildings appear to be placed sporadically, nestled on and around a hill. As we round a bend, the village goes out of sight once more. I can't really put this off any longer. I lean over and shake Tara's shoulder. Hey, wake up. We're almost there. Hold on. Need to make sure that you guys can hear the voices. How <sighs> close is almost? Seriously? I don't know. Couple minutes. Okay, I'm getting up. She isn't getting up. I mean it. If you sleep through the stop, we're just going to... I'm up, Mads. She finally opens her eyes. I cut off the end of my sentence, not sure if I was serious or not. We're not even there yet, and we're already snappy. God, I wish I could sleep. Just a little longer, I tell myself. You excited? A little bit. Lie. You? Kinda nervous still. What is there to be nervous about? We've done this a thousand times. Yeah, well, this isn't like those other thousand times. And you know that. She shrugs again, not meeting my eyes. I don't know, Maddie. I'm sorry. Let's chill. Yeah, sorry. We lapse into silence. At least when she was asleep, it wasn't awkward. I just want off this train. I want to be distracted by going to the cabin and taking in the new sights. Any minute now. Super thrilled to be here. 
She pauses, likely hoping for me to disagree. I don't. But let's just be cool, okay? Let's just try and have a good time. I breathe a deep sigh and let it out slowly. She's right. I'm committed to this trip. I can at least make it easy on myself. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry for getting bitchy. I'm tired. I feel ya. Hey, how do I look? Like you just slept for six hours on a train. That bad, huh? She messes with her hair in some attempt to improve its state. The results are unnoticeable at best. Hopefully it's good enough for... Morgan... Fisher. Morgan Fisher. If she's meeting her online hero or whatever, then I doubt she'll care that your hair's a mess. God, I hope not. I don't want to end up on some fashion faux pas vid. For real though, if she's super fangirly, then let's just let her get it out of her system and hopefully she won't make things weird later. Making things get weird later is... <laughs> kind of our specialty though. Yeah, true. But hey, it got us to a quarter million subs, so like, we must have been doing something right. I just nod. I still can't help but fixate on how everything she says is past tense. It's over after this. It's fully my decision. All I have to do is say the words and things will go back to normal. I doubt Tara would ever bring it up again if I asked her not to. It'd be like so, so easy. step off the train and into another world. A frigid wind saps the heat from my body almost immediately, as if it had been waiting until we arrived to pelt us until our skin felt like it was burning. I instinctively wrap my arms around myself to try to preserve what little body heat I have left, but it doesn't change a thing. I might as well not even be wearing a coat for all the good mine does. As nice as it is to have the moon keeping things from being completely pitch black, I could really go for some cloud cover right about now. Anything that keeps some warmth around us. Tara doesn't even notice the cold. Armed with nothing but her signature jacket, she seems immune to the chill. She oohs and ahs all over the rustic train platform. Like there might be a ghost hiding in the rafters. Just a minute later, the train rumbles off into the night, leaving us behind. Not a single passenger boarded. Tara watches it go, nodding in approval. Okay, this place is already killing it in terms of atmosphere. Like she's completely forgotten the uncomfortable energy that had filled the train. Back to her usual, overly excited self. I should probably be better, but instead, I can't help feeling jealous of just how she can just shake it off. She has a little pocket camera that she's been carrying with her, and she uses it to take a few pictures of the inky blackness surrounding us. I glance upward at the lights which hang from the ceiling. They're small candles, lit with real flame, as opposed to electric. One of them is blown out and swings uselessly in the breeze. They're about as ineffective at keeping away the darkness as my coat is at keeping me warm. The low light will surely ruin Tara's photos, but she's snapping away without a care. You know none of those are actually going to be visible, right? She ignores me. I should probably just let her enjoy the moment. This place really does feel super eerie. Listen. I do, and it soon becomes apparent that what she's referring to, the silence. 
All around us, it's quiet. Even the sound of the train has faded, leaving us in total solitude. The flickering lights of Eisenfeld seem impossibly far away, though I know it can't be more than half an hour's walk. It's so quiet. Isn't that cool? We're definitely not in Kansas anymore. That's one way to put it. I strain my eyes and ears looking for any hints of Morgan, who's supposed to be picking us up. You'd think the sound of a car's engine would carry pretty far out here. For real though, I think this could be the place where we finally get some hard evidence. Something solid. She says this every time, but she usually sounds like she means it more. Just look at it. Something's gotta be out there. I can feel it. We both look off towards the trees. From the train, it was difficult to see where they ended. Here on the platform, it's impossible. My expectations aren't any higher than usual, though. Just that they non-existent. I wonder if Tara really believes what she's saying, either. When she speaks again, her voice is quiet. That would be the perfect send-off, wouldn't it? Her words sting. Damn it, not here. Not already. I want to try and deflect away from this somehow, to set her back on her path. Let her enjoy this moment without me spoiling it. Who knows? Maybe this will be the one that finally gets you a con panel so you don't have to crash someone else's. That was one time, and their panel would have sucked without me. Her voice is an edge of her trip typical bravado again. It's a relief to hear. She returns to her camera, and I give myself a moment to try to take in my surroundings. Supernatural or not, there's something oddly serene about this place. That said, I'd like it a lot more if it wasn't so damn cold. I shiver and cross my arms even tighter. Surely Morgan will be here soon. I can't wait to see the village tomorrow. I hope it's like one of those museum exhibits with the little replica towns and people. In what way? Like, architecturally. She sounds out the words slowly. All rustic and old-timey. I can't imagine that it'll be that different from home. They've got to be modern enough for Morgan to watch Terra Normal after all. If you're expecting people to be walking around in monocles and waistcoats, you're going to be disappointed. And here I thought I'd finally get a chance to show off how amazing I'd look in a top hat. I'm sure you'd be the teen heartthrob of the Victorian era. She gives me a brief snort of amusement. Her responses feel more muted than usual, but the fact that we're still able to banter is a good sign. I'm glad that I can cheer her up, even if I was the cause of her low mood in the first place. However, after a moment, she looks back at me. Her expression is serious for once. Okay, so about Morgan. Like I said before, let's give her a chance to get all the excitement out of the way first. We should be nice and friendly, but let's try to keep it professional. I never thought I'd hear you, of all people, say that. I find myself flashing back to all the unprofessional situations I've had to extricate Terra from. Ranging from one from bad one-night stands to actual police custody. There are a lot of ways I could describe Terra, but professional is definitely not one of them. Hey, I usually make a good first impression. It's just the second impression and beyond that you've got to watch out for. I laugh out loud at that and I catch her smirking before she looks away. She can play it cool all she wants, but I can tell from the way she's bouncing up and down that she's undeniably excited for this fangirling she mentioned. Usually one of her favorite parts. I'm sure a little ego boost will go a long way right about now. I can feel myself hopping back and forth slightly as well. But that's more out of a desire to keep my blood flowing. 
Thankfully, it isn't too long before I can see the silhouette of someone approaching through the storm. Oh, thank God. It's gotta be her, right? Given that we're the only people out here, I really hope so. As the girl gets closer, she gets easier to see. She's not exactly an imposing figure, but she moves with purpose. She's carrying a large fermos, which she raises in greeting as she approaches. I wave back. One of the first things I notice about her is that, for some ungodly reason, she's not wearing a coat. All she's got on to protect her from the frigid weather is what looks like a hand-knit sweater, much like Tara. When she reaches the platform, she greets us with nothing more than a tired smile and a small nod. Not exactly the geeking out Tara was expecting. Hey there, you two. Sorry I'm late. Her voice is friendly, but flat. She sounds like she hasn't slept in days. Tara looks a little bit taken aback by how subdued she is. Recovering quickly, she puts on her big celebrity grin. Oh, uh... No worries. Are you Morgan? That's right. It's really nice to meet you, Tara. Morgan's smile does seem to grow warmer as she greets her, but her face quickly regains a neutral expression a moment later. I can see Tara's smile faltering as she realizes that this is clearly the maximum amount of geeking out that this girl is capable of. To her credit, she recovers well. Likewise. Charmed, I'm sure. Okay, maybe not that well. Tara extends her hand, and Morgan gives her a brief handshake before turning to me. You're Madison, right? I think we spoke online already. Just Maddie is fine. Nice to meet you. She shakes my hand as well. It's a firm, friendly handshake that ends as quickly as it began. Before she continues, she takes another sip from her fermos. I find myself wishing for a cup of coffee, too. It really is nice to meet the two of you. I'm sure you receive a lot of invitations, so I'm glad you were interested in mine. Are you kidding? Remote village in the middle of a huge forest? There's no way I'd pass that up. I've heard all kinds of stories about the things you'll find in places like this. Hopefully not too many, or I won't have anything new for you. Oh, I'm sure you've got something I'll be interested in. Real smooth, Tara. So much for being professional. I can see Morgan's mouth twitch slightly at that comment. I can only hope it was something closer to a smile than a grimace. Tomorrow I can show you around the village. There isn't too much out of the ordinary there, but I'm sure you can find a few things that interest you. That would be wonderful. We can go sightseeing when Tara isn't off chasing spirits around in the woods. Morgan and I both smile. Tara flashes me a look of mock annoyance for the slight. But it's probably eating her up that I've gotten more of a reaction out of Morgan than she has. It's about a half hour's carriage ride to the cabin if you guys want to head out. Do you need help with your bags at all? Tara lifts her bags, giving Morgan another shiny grin. I'm pretty sure I see her accidentally flex her arms, too. <laughs> Don't even worry about it. I got this. Okay, cool. This way. As we follow her, I can see Tara pouting behind her. I've never seen the wind get taken out of her sails like that. At least that gives her another thing to think about besides my departure. Wait a second. Did she say carriage? No. Way. We're standing in front of an honest-to-god horse-drawn carriage. If it weren't for the little white puffs of breath coming from the horse's noses, I'd be willing to believe that it was some sort of commemorative statue. This is so cool! Is it yours? It belongs to my family. Given that there aren't any roads through the woods, there isn't really a point to anyone out here owning a car. I move closer, examining the craftsmanship as best I can in the moonlight. The design is fairly bare bones, but a few flourishes here and there, and some semi-ornate painted finishes, make it clear that this was something built with love and care. 
Somehow, I'm the only one who seems intrigued by our ride. Tara, come take a look at this. As I speak, I look back and see her standing completely still, as if the cold has her rooted to the spot. Give me a sec. I'm just sticking in the view a bit, from a distance. She's trying to act nonchalant, but her wide eyes keep flicking towards the horses. Her previously genuine grin has turned into a very nervous grimace. Slowly inching forward, she scoots further away from the horses as she approaches the carriage. I doubt she planned for part of her first impression to be Morgan learning that she's absolutely terrified of horses. She had better at least learn to tolerate them, or this is going to be an even longer trip than I expected. Wait, if this is the only way through the woods, how are we going to get back and forth between the cabin and the village? Don't tell me we'll have our own carriage. Neither of us can drive one. Oh, I'm going to be driving you. I can take you back and forth and help you navigate the woods. You didn't expect me to just let you wander around a forest in the middle of nowhere without a guide, did you? <laughs> Tara, still slowly making her way towards the carriage, does her best to give me a look of excitement. If anything, it resembles the look of a panicked hostage. The fact that she's still trying to play it cool is almost admirable in its futility. You're sure that's not any trouble? I'd hate to inconvenience you any more than we already have. It's no trouble. I run my own shop, so my schedule is pretty flexible. I'm more than happy to help. She looks over at Tara, who has finally made it within a few feet of the carriage. She shoots at Spofa, thumbs up. I have a feeling she might need it. Trust me, uh, you have no idea. Morgan turns and deftly swings up into her seat, taking a hold of the reins. Tara finally manages to place her hands on the carriage and climb up to sit alongside her, shaking all the way. I let out a sigh of relief and follow suit, mounting up next to Tara. It's a little cramped up here, but I feel weird just sitting by myself. Besides, not keeping an eye on Tara is a pretty guaranteed way to make an even worse first impression. So, can you do any tricks in this thing? The path to the cabin turns out to be a complicated one. She's been making twists and turns through the trees for a few minutes, but Morgan seems to know exactly where she's going. Not even the dark can stand in her way. You can navigate through all this with just that little lantern? How can you see landmarks? Don't worry, I know these woods better than just about anything. Besides, the moonlight is more than enough for me. I can't help but feel embarrassed as I think about all the times I had to use a flashlight on my phone just to find something I dropped in the car. I definitely wouldn't last out here. Looking over, I can see Tara bouncing her leg, probably about to launch into a torrent of questions for Morgan. After that flubbed introduction, she's clearly a little less gung-ho than usual, but I know that won't stop her. As such, I should probably get my handling of the actual adult stuff out of the way quickly before it gets lost in the noise. Is there anything about the town or the people that we should know? Local customs, things to avoid saying, that sort of thing? Morgan thinks about it for a moment, silent. There's a curfew at midnight. Also, you're not supposed to go too far into the forest. I ignore both of those rules a lot. Most of the villagers tend to be sticklers about them, though. Great, so our host is a troublemaker. I guess that means Tara will be in good company. So, while we're on our way, could you maybe tell us about some of the specific supernatural occurrences you've seen here so far? Here she goes. Morgan sits up at the question. She looks over towards us, and her eyes seem to lose a bit of their constant drowsiness. She's been waiting for this. Well, we have a lot of freak weather events. Strange storms that appear and disappear, or are localized to certain parts of the forest in ways that shouldn't be possible. Tara nods solemnly. 
already totally enraptured in what Morgan is saying. Sometimes when I walk in the woods, I can see strange lights here and there. Like tiny little stars inside the forest. I've never been able to get close to them, though. I raise an eyebrow, but don't say anything. We've had countless cases of strange lights before. All of which have ended with a rational explanation. That doesn't seem to damper Terra spirits, though. I start to drift off. This is more Terra's jurisdiction anyway, so I'm sure they can just wake me up when we get there. There's also my cat. Your cat is a supernatural occurrence? She can talk, so I'd say so. Her words snap me out of my trance. Looking over at her, I expect to see her holding in a laugh or sporting some kind of mischievous grin. But her face is as serious as it's been since we arrived. Your cat can talk? Like, talk the way a human does? Yes, she's very well spoken, in fact. I try to hide a sigh. Weird weather and lights in the woods are ambiguous enough that we can play along with them. But every so often we get these blatantly fake claims too. Like a talking cat. Tara, however, instantly perks up once her words sink in. She can't actually believe her, right? So, could we talk to her? She won't mind if I ask her a few questions, right? <laughs> I was hoping you'd ask. I think you'll be very interested in what she has to say. The whole thing is clearly some kind of joke, but Tara is absolutely taken in. I can practically see the wheels turning in her head as she plans out her follow-up questions. That's never good. So, do you have any ideas about what could be causing it? Something in her diet, maybe. I don't think so. Have you been feeding her some kind of special Eisenfeld cat food? Can I try some? Okay, I think that's enough of that. When Tara starts talking about eating cat food, it's time for me to exercise a little diplomacy and move the conversation forward. Crazy or not, I think we should move on. So, what kind of things does she talk to you about? Just about our lives for the most part. I figure you'd be better off hearing it from her rather than me. I'm sure that'll be illuminating. I'll say. If there's something bat paranormal in the village itself, you must have seen way crazier stuff in these woods. She starts to gesture as she talks, pointing back towards the village and swinging her arms around as she mentions the woods. Well, there's one pretty major thing, but you probably won't believe me. I wouldn't have come out here if I didn't believe you. Anything you have to say, I want to hear. I can't detect a hint of cynicism in her voice. Either she really believed this girl she just met has a talking cat, or she's giving a performance worthy of an Oscar. Are you sure? 110%. Lay it on me. She winks at her and flashes her finger guns. Back in celebrity mode. Tara's good at recovery with these things, but I've never seen her recover on this level with such speed. But, as I watch her lean in towards Morgan to make sure she catches her next statement, I realize another possible reason for her passionate response. If there's one thing she loves more than hearing strange stories, it's trying to impress a cute girl. Now things are starting to fall in place a bit more. Well, one of the main reasons I called you out here is... I'm not sure if it has a name, but... It's some kind of forest spirit. Spirit? Like a ghost or something? No, something physical. Some sort of massive creature. Like the forest came to life. Okay, this is new. Even the crazier fans don't get this outlandish. But Tara's absolutely eating it up. No matter what her reasoning is, I'm glad she's having a good time. Is there anything else you can tell me about it? Does it speak or anything? Have you managed to interact with it at all? 
Is it more kaiju sized or more basketball player sized? I've only seen it once, unfortunately, so I don't know too much about it. I've searched for it a number of times since, but without any results. Who knows? Maybe you two will have better luck than I have. That's what you're best at, isn't it? In terms of talents, I'd say it's certainly up there. Morgan's mouth turns up into a small but seemingly genuine smile, and her expression below grows slightly less intimidating. I knew you'd believe me. Nobody else around here does. I can't imagine why. I feel a pang of guilt as that thought crosses my mind. As crazy as her story sounds, it can't possibly be easy feeling rejected in a community this isolated. No wonder she was so eager to bring us into the fold. So, um, how far away would you say we are from the cabin? We should be coming up on it any minute now. I'll help the two of you get situated and then head back. I'll be happy to tell you more about the spirit tomorrow. Thank God. Oh yeah, great. That's great. I'm exhausted. That much isn't a lie. All I want to do right now is pass out. We pass the last of the houses that I can see, but the sparsely marked path continues on towards the forest. The last traces of civilization are behind us now. By any minute now? What exactly did you mean? I can't keep the biting tone entirely out of my voice. Just ahead. See? He points forward into the darkness. I strain my eyes to see anything other than murk. Finally, I spot the faint outline of a small cabin, practically swallowed by forest. I started the heater before I left to get you, so it should be warm. That's what I like to hear. You're like Prometheus. I'm surprised you know who that is. Why? I love that movie. Morgan suddenly jerks the reins and the horses come to a stop. Sarah and I are rattled from our seats and nearly fall forward. Damn it. What? What happened? Rather than answer, Morgan just glares into the darkness where the cabin is. I strain to see what she does as my heart starts to race. Is it a wild animal? A bear? Wolf? There is a sound of footsteps as a shadow detaches itself from the cabin and moves towards us. A human shadow. An older woman comes into view, stopping just at the edge of the lantern's light. She's clearly related to Morgan. Her angular features and steely eyes, barely visible in the dark, makes her look like she stepped out of a Baroque painting. Why are you here? I came to greet our guests. She spits the word our, clearly asserting some sort of ownership. I suck in an involuntary breath as she approaches. Being able to see her more clearly isn't a reassurance. If anything, it's the opposite. Something about her radiates hostility. Even the horses seem uncomfortable. Their ears press back as they stamp their feet in the snow. Up close, her gaze is sharp and fierce. Her face is proud, but sunken. Cheekbones jutting as if her face doesn't quite fit. It makes her look older than she is. Which of you... Is Tara. Mouth drawn thin, she looks from me to Tara and then back again. Each second that passes makes the discomfort grow. I keep waiting for Morgan to intervene, but she doesn't. Tara and I exchange a quick, nervous glance. Then she clears her throat and leans forward, offering a handshake. That's me. The woman regards Tara's outstretched hand for a moment, and ignores it. Welcome to Eisenfeld. My name is Evelyn. The mayor. Who are you? Her attention flicks to me like the hand on the clock. Um, 
I'm Maddie. Madison, Tara's manager? I see. It's clear that she's judging us, though I have no idea on what. Are you done yet? They're tired. You can interrogate them later. Just what exactly is she volunteering us for? Interrogate is kind of a strong word. Our host makes absolutely no effort to disguise the loathing in her voice. In a town as small as this one, I can't imagine that speaking to someone as important as the mayor like that is a good idea. Though, Evelyn appears entirely unfazed. She remains in the middle of the trail, blocking our path. She and Morgan stare each other down while Tara and I sit in painfully uncomfortable silence. After at least a minute, the mayor finally steps out of the way and heads back up the way we came. We'll speak later. It's clearly a command, not a request. The carriage sits immobile until the sound of Evelyn's footsteps are lost in the night. And even beyond that. So she seems nice. Her statement seems to snap Morgan back into the present. Morgan flicks the reins as we begin moving again. <sighs> she turns around to face us, looking genuinely apologetic. I'm so sorry about that. I thought she'd at least wait until tomorrow, and I'd have some time to prepare you beforehand. Is she your mom? Technically. What? No way! How could you tell? Uh, the family resemblance? Morgan purses her lips. Unfortunate, isn't it? Long story short, I didn't tell her that you were going to be staying here until this morning. I'm speechless, hoping that it's just a joke and the punchline fell flat. But Morgan's clearly serious. For the second time in a handful of minutes, I'm wondering what we've gotten ourselves into. Tara laughs, though I can tell it's forced. Well, it's no big deal, right? It's not like she runs your life. Silence. Right? Eventually, Morgan nods. Right. We shouldn't get into it right now, though. I'm sure you'd rather sleep tonight. I can see Tara gathering the breath to disagree and tell Morgan that we'd love to hear all about her family issues right now. So I head her off. Yeah, we would. Whatever family drama it is that she's gotten us involved in, we can at least wait until I'm not about to pass out. The carriage comes to a stop just a few feet away from the door. A small stone path has the snow cleared away from it, and leads to a short flight of stairs. We're facing a large window, though it's dark and impossible to see into. Morgan vaults out of the carriage, nimbly landing on her feet. I'll unlock the door. Your luggage already came in too, so it's inside. Tara launches herself out of the carriage just like Morgan did, and then she quickly scurries away from the patient horses, eyeing them for any sudden movements. I climb down as she stands in extremely safe distance away. I can't carry all of this on my own, you know. I toss her bag and she lurches to catch it, barely keeping it from landing in the snow. We stand back and watch as Morgan fills endlessly with a lock on the door. Pushing and trying again, over and over. Now we're so close to the end, I can feel the last reserves of my energy rapidly draining. The bags in my arms feel like they weigh a million pounds. So, what do you think? She mutters as quietly as she can, though her timing couldn't be worse. I think I want to go to bed. Same as ever, then. You know me. Rubbing my arms, I peer into the forest. Just beyond the first few lines of trees, everything fades into an inky blackness, thick and impenetrable. 
I shiver, not entirely because of the cold. A cool breeze rattles the empty branches as they scrape against each other, mimicking the way I'm trying to stay warm. Finally, there's a banging sound as Morgan solves the mystery of the lock and nearly falls through the door. She pokes her head back through like nothing happened. I got it open. Hallelujah. I haul my way inside and into the blessed warmth. It's been so long since we've been near a working heater. The small lamp on the side table casts a bit of light over the small room. Our luggage, as promised, is scattered haphazardly around the living room. Just like home. Tara slips past me to bounce around and examine it all. Her bags hurled as carelessly as I pulled them out of the carriage. Oh my god! Holy shit! This is so cool! There's nothing really out of the ordinary, so I just stand there and wait for her to get it all out of her system. Isn't this the coolest? It's like staying in a history museum. That's the kind of thing you'd usually treat like a punishment. Are you kidding me? I love history. We even did that whole series on the history of cryptids in the American Midwest. And I spent like three months on that special about Bigfoot's impact on the Great Depression. That's one of my favorite episodes. I had never heard of the theory that FDR was a cousin of Sasquatch. <laughs> to be fair, I don't think FDR did either. Morgan laughs, and I just roll my eyes. I mean the kind of history that actually happened. History is doomed to repeat itself, Mads. I don't even respond. That whole episode felt like the plot of an awful low-budget B-movie. Instead, I cross the living area towards a tiny hallway with a pair of identical doors. These are the bedrooms? That's right. They're the same size, so there's not much of a difference. Guess I'll take this one then. I push open the closer door. Inside, it's just four walls with a bed, a shelf, and a small dresser. I drop my bag on the floor and roll my suitcases in. Tara lingers in the living room, talking about the features of the cabin with Morgan. <sighs> Suddenly, I hear her yelp in pain or horror. I rush back out, knocking over my suitcase and nearly slamming into the door as I go. I half expect to see Morgan holding a bloody knife or something, but instead, Tara's just holding her phone. What happened? A tragedy. Actually, worse, the apocalypse. Check out your phone. I do as she says, expecting a news article or an alert or something, but there's nothing. What? I don't have anything. Exactly. No service out here. I check. Sure enough, she's right. There isn't the barest trace of a signal at all. What about Wi-Fi? I, uh, I assume we have that, right? Technically. Oh, no. I stocked up on books and downloaded a bunch of new films before we left, since I wasn't expecting to have much connection out here anyway. But I'm willing to bet the thought never even crossed Tara's mind. Good thing I packed a few books I think she'll like, too. Tara glumly pockets her phone again as Morgan gives us a small smile. Let me give you the quick tour. I don't think it's entirely necessary since we can see everything ourselves, but I don't stop her. This is the kitchen. There's a stove and an oven. The stove is somewhat picky and doesn't always like to work. Actually, I guess it's the same for the oven. Don't worry, I don't know how to cook anyway. Over here is the fireplace. I can show you how to chop firewood sometime if you'd like. I think I might pass on that one. This is the couch. You can also sleep on it if you'd like. It doesn't unfold into a bed or anything, but I sometimes come here and sleep on it anyway. That doesn't even surprise me. 
The Wi-Fi password is on a note by the phone. So is my phone number, so you can reach me anytime. Do you have any questions? I shake my head and look at Tara, who does the same. I think we're good. Thanks for all your help tonight, Morgan. It was my pleasure. Again, I can't thank you enough for coming all the way out here. I'll be sure to make it worth your time. I'm sure. Can't wait to get started. Me either. But I should probably be going for tonight. I've kept you up long enough as it is. She heads out the front door, waving goodbye. Night, Morgan. Thanks again. Good night. Through the large window, we can see as she starts to make her way down the path. I'm gonna go to bed too. Yeah. Yeah, same. We switch off the lamp as we head to our respective rooms. Tara grabs her bags from the floor where she tossed them. Alright, see you in the morning then? Yeah, night. I shut the door behind me and she does the same. I sway like a zombie as I stalk towards my bed. It takes the last of my strength to dig my pajamas out of my suitcase and change. There's a window here that looks straight out into the forest. First thing I do is pull the curtain shut. Crawling into bed, I face away from the window and pull the blanket up to my chin. It's heavy and warm, and I wrap it around myself like a burrito. The bed is firmer than I'm used to, and the pillow thinner. There are like three other blankets though, so I ball one of them up and use it as a second pillow. As I try to get comfortable, my thoughts start to drift off. The detached part of me is glad that the timing worked out well enough to avoid jet lag. And in all, aside from the Wi-Fi, this is pretty nice as far as accommodations go. Especially since we're not paying for it. It seems strange that Morgan would come all the way out here just to take naps sometimes, but... I can already tell that most of what Morgan does would be considered strange. Strange, but harmless. I don't mind. But when I think of her mother, the mayor, a chill runs down my spine and I bundle myself even more tightly in the blankets. I should give her a second chance, though. Especially if she didn't have any warning about our arrival. It stands to reason that she'd be annoyed at Morgan renting out her family's cabin like that. When I think of it that way, her reaction seems pretty justified. I'll just be extra polite to her next time we meet. Hopefully it isn't an interrogation like Morgan said. That was probably just her being dramatic. I yawn, wishing sleep would come faster. I expect it to be out before my head even hit the pillow. Not lying here with my thoughts racing. I try to block out everything and focus on my breathing. In. Out. In. Out. In. A loud tap 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 on the window cuts through the silence. My heart leaps to my throat as I bolt upright in bed. I get tangled on the blanket, scrambling to hold them off me. With one hand, I desperately feel for my glasses nearby. I finally find them and shove them onto my face, nearly jabbing my eye out. Before, I look to the window, one that made me uncomfortable from the start. It's Morgan. Lantern in hand, fists raised against the glass. She stands there patiently. She knows what kind of emotional roller coaster she just put me through. She doesn't show it. Shakily, I walk over to the window, not even switching on the lamp. With some difficulty, I wrench it open, disturbing a small mound of snow. Yes? It's the best I can manage. Anything longer, and I'm not sure I can keep it civil. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. Please be ready to go by eight, and I'll come pick you up. I just blink, unable to comprehend what I'm hearing. Is that okay? We could make it 8.30, but no later. 
No, no. Eight is fine. Is that all? That's right. Have a good night. Sorry if I disturbed you. I slam the window shut and hobble back to bed. She doubled back in the snow and scared the hell out of me for that. I check the time on my phone. It's nearly midnight. Eight hours to sleep and then be ready to go. It's going to be a long month, isn't it? It's eight hours and 34 minutes later. I know because telling time is my phone's only remaining function. Yet I still check it constantly, like something might change. True to her word, Morgan was there to pick us up right at 8. It's a minor miracle that Tara and I were both ready to go. I don't know who had it worse. Me waking up to my alarm, or a Tara waking up to me banging on her door. Even now, she slowly eats a piece of bread from the kitchen, looking for all the world like a check cow chewing cud. With each bump that the carriage hits, my tiny cup of coffee threatens to spill onto my hand. I'm not sure that I'd feel it. After answering Morgan's perfunctory questions about our first night, we spent the rest of the ride in silence. She didn't acknowledge at all how she had knocked on my window. Apparently it wasn't remarkable enough to her to deserve another mention. I watch from over her shoulder now as we approach the town. On the train last night, scattered lights made Eisenfeld appear to be a lot larger than it really is. Now in the daylight, I have to strain my eyes to pick out some of the buildings against the hills and snow. Tara's missing it all, staring at her feet. Crumbs litter the floor beneath her. Morgan guides us along a path that I'm pretty sure is the same one as last night. Few villagers move out of the way of our carriage, not even turning to look. Must be a regular occurrence. Even though it's hard for anyone to see us in here, I still feel self-conscious. I clutch the bag of camera gear tighter to my chest, hiding myself behind it. There aren't any other carriages on the road, nor anything bigger than a pushcart. So we still stand out, at least in my head. If the situation is at all awkward or out of the ordinary to Morgan, she doesn't show it. She pulls the reins and the carriage comes to a stop in the road. There aren't as many other people up here, but what few there are give us a wide berth. And here we are. Tara finally perks up, words clearly spoken for her benefit. It takes her a moment to realize that we've made an entrance. But as soon as she does, she's in showbiz mode. She leaps to her feet, throwing off the exhaustion like a disguise. Here we are indeed. She bolts out of the carriage, spinning circles like we're in the middle of a grand plaza instead of the middle of the street. I climb out more carefully and then scurry out of the way. Okay, this rules. It really does feel like we've traveled back in time. The buildings, all built from wood and stone, look like they've been here for centuries. The road that we're on and currently blocking is made of cobblestone. It winds its way through the town, despite being covered in well-tamped snow. We're certainly a long way from home. Morgan doesn't disembark from the carriage, and instead calls down to us. The town square is right down this road. But if I take you there, I won't be able to turn the carriage around. It's always a pain when that happens. I'm going to open up my shop, but feel free to come by whenever you'd like. I'm sorry I can't show you around right now, but I'll make it up to you later. Where's your shop? Oh, right. She pulls a piece of paper from somewhere and dangles it towards me. I cross the road and take it from her. Unfolding it, I can see that it's a map. Despite being hand-drawn, it's pretty coherent and legible. Certain buildings, like Morgan's shop and the local pub, are denoted by handwritten tags. At the middle of the road where we're currently standing, she's even drawn in a helpful you-are-here notice with a smiley face. 
She clearly planned this well in advance. Cool. Thanks. Feel free to stop by around lunch. I'll make you both something. Hell yeah! You're the best, Morgan. Thanks. Morgan gives us a brief wave before heading off to wherever it is you park horse-drawn carriages. I point in the direction of the town square that Morgan mentioned, wanting to get away from all the people who are currently gawking at us. We definitely stick out, if only because of our colorful hair and clothes. Combined, their outfits have the color palette of a bowl of oatmeal. Although they stare, nobody really says anything, either too polite or too intimidated. Both Tara and I avoid eye contact with strangers as we hurry to the empty town square. Well, that couldn't have gone worse. There are a million ways that could have gone worse. If people looking at us funny is the only downside of this trip, then it'll be our best episode yet. I mean, ever. I wish she'd stop bringing that up. It always kills the mood, which is barely on life support to begin with. Tara rubs her shoulders, having stubbornly chosen not to dress any warmer today. Okay, ready to get your Terra normal on, Mads? I shrug my camera bag onto my shoulder and nod. I suppose there's no harm in spending a little time establishing the location. Might as well get some B-roll while we're here. One thing that both Tara and I have in common is that we're not really sightseers. I spend as much time in my room as I can, whether that's the hotel room while we're filming or my bedroom at home. So as much as Tara loves investigations and all the dramatic stuff, she'd probably totally skip the exposition sec segments if she didn't leave them to me. That means we're pretty efficient at filming them. I turn on the camera and slowly turn a circle, capturing the ground, sky, and some nearby buildings for footage that we can splice together later. I do a slow pan across some of the houses, then frame and hold a shot of the path further into the village. A young couple passes by, holding hands, and they share a suspicious look at the camera as they go by. Guess I'm editing that part out later. Most of the time, making Terra normal videos is just me finding ways to stretch 10 seconds of interesting footage into a 10 minute video. That's something else that we're both good at. The cold wind makes it hard to keep a steady grip, so I stow the camera and shove my hands into my pockets. Get anything cool? Unable to browse on her phone like she usually does while waiting, instead Terra watches from over my shoulder as I record. Not really. There's not much to see here. Yeah, it's kinda less impressive up close. It's the kind of place that you'd expect a tumbleweed to blow through. Like if the climate fit. Wow, you're turning into quite the poet. Oh, shut up. What? It was a compliment. Anyway, since filming the village is a dud right now, we should follow up one of the rumors Morgan was talking about the other night. I'm thinking... Giant Tree Spirit. That's the most interesting one she talked about for sure. That's the headliner. We need to build up to that one. Oh yeah, definitely. Picture this. We head to the woods to get some creepy shots. Do it right around sundown. Make it super ambient. Lots of atmosphere, wind sounds, maybe a wolf howl. You've got a good wolf sound effect we could use, right? Yeah, of course. Anyway, I do a narration over all that, introducing where we are and what we're out here looking for. Then we get a sound of a big branch snapping and just cut the video right there. Tara looks pleased with herself and glances back at me for approval. Takes me a minute to react. So, in the video on a cliffhanger? Yeah, I think so. We can definitely stretch the Eisenfeld stuff into a mini-series or something. We should be able to get at least three episodes worth of stuff out here. That sounds fine. A snapping branch is a pretty weak way to end it, though. 
especially since like we uploaded the video no one's going to wonder if we're okay or not oh that's true so you think maybe we just make one long vid or end it differently maybe a different ending i'll think of something later cool you're the best mads i smile but it hurts a little i'm sure she's not trying to make me feel bad she probably doesn't even know what i do I just shrug, waiting to change the subject. We can also follow up on some of the smaller rumors. Like, in her email, she mentioned mysterious lights out in the forest. Like a will-o'-wisp? Aren't those actually real? You're the expert. You should know that, not me. Tara stares at me expectantly. Yes, they're real, but it's just swamp gas. It doesn't matter, though, because we need to wait for nighttime for that stuff. It's not very spooky during the daytime. In that case, we definitely want to talk to the locals. See what kind of rumors they've heard of. That kind of thing. Right. That's definitely the smart thing to do. We both faced back towards the street we came down, where Morgan dropped us off with all those nosy people. Who just stared at us, but wouldn't talk. Awkwardly. Or we could get some more establishing shots from other parts of the village. <laughs> I like that idea. We pick a direction at random and start walking. As we head further into town, it starts to get more lively. And there are more people around. That might just be the time of day, though. A couple folks shovel snow in front of their homes. A group of kids run up and down the street, accompanied by a sagging basset hound. A woman wearing what appears to be an entire bear for a coat shuffles past us. Wherever we go, the villagers wash us unabashedly. No one makes any attempt to talk to us, and conversations fall silent whenever we come near. I wonder if there was some sort of order given to not speak with us, or if it just happened naturally. I try to force myself to ignore it. We're not doing anything wrong, we're just a curiosity. The only interesting thing about us is our out-of-townness. Morgan said that there are rarely ever visitors out here. It's not hard to imagine why. There doesn't seem to be much worth visiting. Still, if they're going to keep this up, it's going to make those interviews even harder to do. Tara taps me on the shoulder nodding in the direction of some of our observers. Is it just me, or is there kind of a creepy serial killer vibe going on here? Oh my god, can you not? Hey, hey, I'm just kidding. Just trying to lighten the mood a bit. My reaction never ruined any chance of that. Neither of us speak again. I unpack the camera again and film a few of the storefronts as we go. As long as I'm sort of tipsy. Surreptitious enough, most people don't notice and thus don't change their behavior. Inevitably, whenever someone does see me filming, they tense up and just stare, ruining the take. It's like they've never seen a camera before. Maybe that's not far from the truth. One thing I have to give to Eisenfeld's credit is that there's more personality in its construction than I thought at first. Most of the buildings seem to be people's homes, but it doesn't take us long to find a few stores here and there. The names are simple and plain, like you'd read in a tabletop RPG book. Heinkel and Sons Tailoring, a butcher shop named the Hardy Sow, that sort of thing. When we pass by a tavern called the Bushy Beard, I can hear Tara snickering behind me. Do you think they have barmaids? I... what? Like the sexy Oktoberfest kind? Do you think they have those here? Tara's words are so out of nowhere that they take me a second to mentally process. This isn't a renaissance fair, Tara. I'm pretty sure they just wear normal clothes to work. Tara's mouth gapes wide open. Wait, what? Back up. Ren fairs have sexy barmaids? Where else did you think they come from? I have no idea. I always thought those things were just full of boring stuff. 
What? Not at all. They have swordplay demonstrations or time period appropriate foods. Some local experts will give talks or lectures on certain topics and... Like I said, boring stuff. Whatever. There's more to it than just cosplay. I bet you'd actually like it if you went with me next time. Plus, I thought you loved history now. <laughs> Not the boring kind of history. Duh. How are swords boring? <laughs> Whatever, Mads. She walks away. How did I manage to lose an argument she started? We cut a slow but steady course through the village. Despite how random the layout seems, it's impossible to get lost. All the roads seem to lead back into each other. I'm so used to the sounds of busy intersections and highways that the mere silence here is almost unnerving. I can appreciate the serenity and calm of it all, but I think I'd go crazy if I had to live here. We're not even a full day in, and I can't help but miss my cozy apartment and the convenience of city life. Eventually, we take a path that brings us back to a familiar site, the town square that we visited right after Morgan dropped us off. According to my phone, it's been a little bit over an hour since then. Still too early to meet up with Morgan for lunch. I guess we can't keep putting this off for any longer. I think I have enough of the town now. Do you want to start interrogating the villagers? In ter ing I didn't even notice myself misspeaking. I must still have interrogations on the mind after meeting the mayor last night. Tara poses dramatically, hyping herself up for the camera. I'm not even recording yet. Time to put my game face on. As long as it's a game face that people want to talk to. Mads, when have I ever been anything but charming? She sighs. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'll keep it chill for these so we don't freak anyone out. But, like, how do we do this? Just go up to people and ask if we can chat? I guess. I don't have any better ideas. This is how we usually do it. Except usually people are more curious about who we are and what we're doing. Sometimes after introducing ourselves, there are even people who have heard of us. That is definitely not the case out here. Hell, I wouldn't be surprised if Morgan was the only person in this whole village that uses YouTube. The only thing more awkward than just asking random people for an interview is them staring silently while you approach. But we don't have any other options. I hand the mic to Tara. At least I'm not the person who has to do the talking. Tira stands there with a mic in hand. And stands there. You good? Yeah, I am. Just give me a sec, okay? Okay. She psychs herself up by stretching and taking a few deep breaths. The whole time, she holds the mic pinched between two fingers like it's something she just peeled off her shoe. When she's finally ready, she gives me a thumbs up and starts to walk again. I trail a couple meters behind, keeping her back framed in the middle of the shot. She moves with a determined stride, but I can see the microphone shaking in her hand. We pass by a few people walking around, but she doesn't stop any of them. Nor does she ask any of the folks outside the buildings, chatting or working or just sitting and looking bored. Just up ahead, a middle-aged woman smokes a cigarette, looking at nothing and no one in particular. It doesn't look like she's going anywhere, and she's not already in the middle of a conversation. She's the perfect candidate, and Tara must know it too. I wait for her to go up and introduce herself. I stand still and hit the record button, filming her approach. Except she doesn't. She walks right past the lady, whose gaze follows as she goes. I pause the recording and hurry to catch up, hissing Tara's name. 
I have to say it twice before she hears me and stops. Sup? What are you waiting for? We've passed like a dozen people now. Right, but none of them are the right one. Which one is the right one? If you know it's impossible to tell, I'll know when I see them. I roll my eyes, but I don't chastise her. She's trying her best. Oh, okay, here we go. Get ready. I follow her line of sight to figure out her prey. An older man resting on a bench nearby. Broad-shouldered and with a long beard. He looks like a stereotype of a lumberjack. Like the previous woman, he stares vapidly off into the distance. Thoughts clearly elsewhere. Once again, I plant my feet and set up the shot. I make micro-adjustments to the focus until I get it just right. The rest is up to Tara. Slowly, Tara approaches the man. Either he doesn't see her coming, or he ignores her. She glances at me for reassurance, which I give in the form of a smile and a nudging motion, telling her to get on with it. She clears her throat, grabbing the man's attention. He turns to her slowly, and eyes her suspiciously. Then, he notices me in the camera, and he tenses up. Not off to a good start. Tara talks quickly, trying to explain the situation. Hi there, my name's Tara Brick. My friend Maddie and I are visiting from out of town, doing a report on Eisenfeld. I was wondering if we could ask you a few questions. Report? What kind of report? He relaxes just a little bit. The man rubs his eyes warily, peering back and forth between me and Tara. I wish he'd stop looking directly into the camera. I slowly start to move laterally, trying to frame the two of them better, but he keeps shifting on the bench to watch me. It's an investigation on the supernatural. Rumors, ghost stories, that sort of thing. We've heard a lot of legends about Eisenfeld, and we're looking into them, trying to figure out what's true and what isn't. Figure out the truth, huh? The man mutters darkly, his beetle-browed eyes still flipping between me and Tara. He chews his lips while he thinks about it. Something about his face strikes me as odd, but I can't quite figure out what it is. It's probably just a trick of the camera or the light. Well, alright. I suppose I've got the time. It takes Tara a beat to respond. We were both sure he was going to tell us to bug off, or worse. Great, thank you. So, uh, can you tell me about Eisenfeld? Just what is life like here, on an average day, that sort of thing. Clearly she didn't expect to get this far, and asks the first thing that comes to mind. She offers the man the mic, but he just stares uncomfortably until she retracts it. Right, well, it's a good little town. Good and proper. Quiet. Real quiet. That's what I like about it. None of that city business. No noise and bustle. Out here, it's just you and nature. That suits me just fine, it does. So you're from around here, then? Spent your life in Eisenfeld? Born and raised, and God willing, I'll die out here, too. Never thought about leaving. Never had a reason to. Great, great. So then I'd imagine you know all about any local legends, right? Hmm. About as well as anyone. Any old village has got its stories. If you believe them all, there's goblins in the woods, trolls in the mountains, and who knows what else elsewhere. Of course, it's only children who believe in those. So you've never seen anything weird yourself? Nothing unexplainable? Weird like what? And now the man is abandoned looking at Tara entirely, and instead focuses on the camera, his eyes looking strangely focused. One of our friends here mentioned something about a big forest spirit. Like a, a walking tree kind of thing. He sits up from his slouch, finally turning to face Tara. What friend of yours might that be? Uh, she's from around here. One of the locals. 
Even though we gave her a shout out in one of our videos, Tara's reluctance to name Morgan as our contact. It makes sense. Her neighbors surely feel different about us than our viewers do. Ugh. I'll bet it was the Fisher child, wasn't it? If you know what's best for you, you'll steer clear of her. Nothing but trouble comes from that one. Nothing at all. Tara and I exchange a glance. Seems her thoughtfulness was relevant. Irrelevant. At the same time, I'm suddenly a lot more interested in what this guy has to say. Why do you say that? It feels like a strange violation of privacy to be asking this stranger his opinion of our host. But if she's notorious enough that anyone on the street knows of her, then perhaps we're better off knowing why. Fitting into the snow, our subject stands and turns his back to us. There are some questions you ought not be asking, miss. I'll be going now. Enjoy yourselves. He lumbers off into the town, though I don't watch him for very long. Questions we ought not to be asking, huh? I'm not sure if that's a threat or not. For the sake of my anxiety, I try to tell myself it's not. I joined Tara on the bench, doing my best to avoid the puddles of melted snow. That was something. That's putting it nicely. I don't know what that was either. Maybe Tara's right. It was something. You get it all? She taps two fingers against the camera in my hand. Of course. All two uncomfortable minutes. I wasn't given a lot to work with there. I replay the recording, with Tara leaning over to watch along with me. It's not any less awkward the second time through. We're, uh... Well, we already knew we need to talk to a few different people. Just got unlucky on the first one. Know what I mean? Tara stands up, but I remain seated. Still need another minute? I don't say anything. I'm trying to think of what to say. Hello? Earth to Maddie, please respond. I'm thinking. My voice is too harsh and snappy, and we both know it. I play through the clip again, this time without Tara watching. Something still seems off to me, and it's not just the gruff way he left. Look, we knew Morgan was a bit weird. All of our fans are weird. That's why they're our fans. In a tiny little town like this, of course anyone who's different is going to have a reputation. That doesn't make Morgan a bad person. I'm not saying she's a bad person. I didn't say anything. But if you had to ask, I'm sitting here thinking that it's really freaking shady that a guy just guessed we were here with Morgan, and then that he up and left as soon as he found out. That's not normal. That's not something that's happened to us before. Great. That means we're on the right track. If they're hiding something, then that means there's something to hide. Have you completely lost your mind? This is ridiculous, even for Tara. I can imagine, I can understand her wanting to give Morgan a chance, but to actually buy into her nonsense? Tara nods and looks down at her feet, brushing some snow off her shoes. It's only been a couple hours, Mads. He's just one old cranky geezer. Please, please just try to have some patience on this one, okay? For me... I check my watch. It hasn't even been two hours. That only makes her more right, as much as I hate to admit it. Sighing, I place my head in my hands. Sorry, I'm still tired. It's okay. After a long moment, I stand. You wanna find somebody else? Guess we oughta. We traipse wordlessly through town a bit more. I keep the camera stowed. I'll set up when we find someone. Now that we've been burned once, I start to understand why Tara is so reluctant to speak to anyone. What once seemed like people tightening their clothes against the cold now seems like more like turning their shoulders towards us. A suspicious number of folks look away from us to cough. The amount of times we pass by the same places certainly doesn't help our appearance. 
I know that there are a few especially chatty villagers that have seen us pass by at least four times. It takes another 15 minutes of looping around town before we find another candidate. A pair of girls about our age are waiting outside a shop. Inside, a third girl is talking to the shopkeeper. People our age are going to be our best bet. One of the waiting girls sips from a small mug of what I assume is coffee. She sees us and nods her head in greeting. That's the nicest reception we've gotten so far. What about them? Worth a try. This time, I approach with Tara. I let her take the lead, but I follow close behind, forcing myself to smile in order to seem more approachable. Excuse me. The talking girl and shopkeeper turn towards us at the same time. Their conversation snaps off immediately. Excuse me, hey there. Hello. The girl next to her leans in to whisper something in her friend's ear, but doesn't talk to us. Hey, um, so my friend and I are here from out of town. <laughs> we know. They both giggle to themselves. We're filming a documentary sort of thing about Eisenfeld, and I was wondering if I could ask you some questions. Eisenfeld? <laughs> Why here? What about it? Well, we're doing a video about any sort of rumors or local legends that you might have out here. Ghost stories or that kind of thing. The two girls talk to each other in low voices that I can't pick up. The choir girl is muttering something, and the girl with coffee is agreeing and nodding along. As one, they turn to face us again. I don't think there's anything like that out here. This isn't that kind of place. Not a single one. When you were kids, your parents didn't tell you stories about things that lived in the forest? You've never been out late at night and seen something you can't explain? We're not allowed out late at night. Right. There's a curfew. The girls go quiet, nodding to themselves. Sensing a dead end, Tara changes her tactics. Do either of you know a girl named Morgan? She's the mayor's daughter. But the first girl, the one with the coffee, grins at that and pulls at her companion's arm. The other girl swats her away, face turning pink. Oh, I'm pretty sure everyone knows her. She smiles devilishly at her embarrassed friend. Some of us better than others. What's she like? Why is she so famous? She isn't that bad. She's just... She's trouble and you know it. Staying out after hours, sneaking around town, she spends a lot of time out in the woods, too. Sometimes overnight. What do you think she's doing out there? If there's a particular conclusion we're supposed to have reached, it's lost on me. Still, it can't be coincidence that we're two for two now on people being weirded out by Morgan. Three for three if I count myself. Do you think there's something out there? The two girls blink, as if their reaction was planned. Something like what? Tara shrugs. No idea. Like I said, that's what we're researching. I don't think you'll find anything like that here. I'm sorry, but this isn't a very interesting place. Right. I stride away, leaving her behind. I head into a corner between two buildings, out of sight of the girls we spoke to. Tara catches up and then leaves against the wall next to me. <sighs> that didn't go much better. Really, you think? Was it just a coincidence that these two other random people we met happened to have the same opinion of Morgan as the first? She didn't tell her mom, the mayor of the whole town, that we're going to be staying in a cabin that her mother probably owns for a month. She rambles off stuff that makes any one of our videos look like an episode of Scooby-Doo, and then the next morning just dumps us off in the middle of the village. We haven't even been here for a day yet. We've seen our host for like an hour tops, and we were practically asleep for most of that. How am I supposed to have a good opinion of her so far? Oh yeah, she's gotta work. Come on, Mads, have a little faith. What's the worst that can happen? 
the lead turns out to be nothing like the other 200 times before. Some girls gossip about us. An old bum tells us to get lost. 207. And the worst part is that the whole town hates us while we're stuck here after spending thousands of dollars to cross the world. To live in a wood cabin with no phone service and barely any internet. For a month. You've got to see the problem here, Tara. Tara sighs and throws up her hands. Okay, so what? What is it that you want me to do? We're here and you hate it. I get it. So what's the solution? What is it you're hoping for here? Like I said before, let's just deal with it. Make the best of it we can and try to have some fun. That was the whole point of this thing. It was supposed to be fun. If she's trying to encourage me, she's doing a terrible job of it. Whatever. Let's just get this over with. And this time, don't mention Morgan. If nobody here likes her, then you're probably better off not bringing her up. I can see that she wants to say something. Probably argue. But then she deflates and nods. Okay, no Morgan. She goes quiet for a moment, staring off into the town. She takes a breath and sighs, visibly relaxing. She starts to lead the way, not looking back at me. I feel a sharp pang of guilt as I stare at her back. I did promise to try, and here I am again, making everything worse. Tara. She stops in place. Sorry. Again. Really. She smiles a bit sadly, but shrugs. I get it, Mads. We're cool. Let's go, and there's a lot more paranormal in our future. We exchange a small smile before continuing our march on. Eisenfeld seems to have built, been built so that no matter what, you're always walking uphill. We make our way up yet another one, past a low, crumbling wall and a few more houses. As we make our way up the street, a bitter-looking old woman with a broom stops what she's doing and eyes us. We've walked this part of the road several times now, but she wasn't here before. Hey you! Who are you? You aren't from around here? The last part is definitely a statement, not a question. Tara slows down just a bit to mutter beside me. Looks like we found number three. Tara immediately puts on a friendlier face as we approach. Good morning, ma'am. You're right. We're not. I'm Tara, and this is Maddie. We're here doing a research documentary on Eisenfeld. Would you mind if we asked you a couple questions? About? Some of the local legends and rumors from around here. I'm actually afraid that she's going to say yes, because I can already tell this is going to end as badly as the first two. I've decided how to answer Tara's question of what I want. I just want to go back to the cabin and be bored. At least it's not awkward and uncomfortable in there. Yeah, alright. Oh no. Great, thank you. So, we've been hearing a lot about stuff out in the woods, like... You are? Who told you that? We've been interviewing a few people this morning, and it's something that came up a few times. Stuff like lights, strange noises, that kind of thing. Have you ever witnessed anything like that? Never. She looks around again, then steps just a little bit closer to us. Look, I'm going to tell you this now for your own good. No one around here wants any trouble. We all just want to live our lives in peace. That's what Eisenfeld's all about. Mayor Fisher does a damn good job keeping things nice and orderly around here. We keep to ourselves, and I expect the two of you to do the same. She nods solemnly, the interview clearly over. Just as useless as the other two. As we go, Tara weaves, waves over her shoulder. Thanks for your time! And then, so only I can hear her. <clears throat> As we walk away, I can tell it's not necessary to say anything to Tara. She trudges along beside me. Annoyed as I am, I still feel bad seeing her so bummed out. 
Maybe it's finally starting to sink in. So now what? She asked me that after the second interview, too. Now? I don't know. Let's go to Morgan's shop and eat lunch. Wait, for real? You want to go see Morgan? Mostly I want to go see what Morgan makes for lunch. I'll take it. But hey, can you like... I'll be cool. Don't worry. She smiles, relieved. Yeah, I know. Sorry. I know you will. I take out the map that Morgan gave us this morning. By now, I've been through the village enough times that I can mostly navigate there by memory. What kind of shop does Morgan run? Do you remember? I think she said it's an antique shop. What do those places even sell? Antiques. Lots of furniture that's been around for decades, or random stuff like books and glassware. That's oddly specific. My mom's into antiquing. She always says, you never know what you'll find. We should do an antique episode of Terranormal someday. We can have your mom on as a guest star. <laughs> I'm sure she'd love that. Do you think Morgan sells anything really out there? Like a possessed baby doll or a cursed sword. Who would want to buy those kinds of things? The same people who go to Ren fairs. She got me. I can't help but laugh. Tara grins, enjoying the feedback. Come on, Matt. Every good horror story starts out with buying something fishy from the local antique store. Maybe she has a special section for items with an ancient prophecy about them. We're specifically trying to avoid the horror story scenarios, remember? Oh, right, right. Yeah, I guess that would suck to live through. Okay, what if she lets us interview her talking cat instead? That's like a whole episode's worth of stuff right there. The internet loves cat videos. That one could go viral. That's what I'm saying. Oh, we should prep a list of questions for it before we get there, so we know what to say. Ask it which brand of cat food tastes best. We can sell the video rights to that company. Come on, I'm serious. <laughs> Wait, what? What? You seriously think that cat is going to talk? Tara shrugs, looking like she never questioned the idea. I'm just trying to be prepared. I thought she had gotten the picture after that last interview went awry, but it seems like she's still giving Morgan some benefit of the doubt. It's not even worth arguing with her over. She'll see soon enough as it is. I check over Morgan's map again. We're definitely in the area since it says her shop is right by City Hall. Problem is, while her map shows how to get to the general area of her shop, it doesn't say which building it is. There are several buildings that could fit. Do you think this is the place? It has to be. Tara's stomach growls loudly. Her voice is more like a plea than an affirmation. Go check. What? Check what? Like, go check if it's her place or not. Absolutely not. I'm not going to just potentially walk into someone's home. What's the big deal? If it's not her place, we can just ask for directions. No way. Trespassing is your thing, not mine. We go back and forth like this for a while, and right before we finally decide to set it with a rock, paper, scissors, Morgan herself pokes her head out the door. Hey you two, I'm in here. For the first time since she met us at the station, I'm genuinely relieved to see Morgan. Morgan holds the door open, a book under her arm and a cup of coffee in her free hand. Tara turns to me and talks in a quiet voice. Ready to uncover some ancient treasures? Lead on, Indiana. She doesn't need telling twice. Tara practically dashes the rest of the way inside, nearly bumping into Morgan as she goes. I nod stiffly at her as I enter more slowly. The door slams shut behind us. Morgan flips the sign on the door to close, although it's nearly invisible from the outside. Her shot looks just about how I expected. 
Piles of junk are strewn across chipped shelves. Many items aren't displayed so much as they appear to have been tossed and then forgotten. A thick layer of dust covers everything. Tara is already bobbing around the store, examining some worryingly look fragile ceramics. Morgan passes by her and back to the front counter, where she sets down the book she was carrying. Its title catches my eye, Complete Collection of Classic Fairy Tales. The book looks extremely old. I wonder if it's an item for sale here. So, are you done looking around town? If she has any guess what kind of response we got today, she doesn't show it. She's still impossible to read. I've seen enough for today. Can we still take you up on that lunch offer? Sure thing. I've got something on the stove already. I figured you'd be coming over soon. Stove? Your store has a kitchen? Yeah. I have a living space set up in the back since I sleep here most of the time. Feel free to look around. I'll be back. She disappears behind a curtain leading to another room, leaving us surrounded by... treasures. When the whole town feels like an antique, a rocking chair and a few pieces of farming equipment probably aren't the biggest draws. I'm surprised she's even able to keep the place open. Tara's enthusiasm doesn't seem to have dimmed a bit, however. She takes time to examine each piece, turning it over in her hands like she's appraising fine art. One of these is probably cursed. Oh yeah, definitely. It's probably the grandfather clock over there. No way, that's too easy. And even if it is cursed, it's probably something lame like making your toe hair grow twice as fast. But this, well... Tara takes an item off the counter, holding it close to her chest. It's a lamp, but the stand is free, very realistic pigs standing on top of each other. The lampshade has these little piggies printed on it like a scripture. This is the big leagues. You want a curse that's going to last for generations? You use this bad boy. Hey, you think Morgan would mind if I brought my Ouija board in here? As she says that, she puts the pig lamp back in its rightful place, where it can't hurt anyone. I wonder how that works, actually. Like, if you bring two cursed objects to the same place, do the evil spirits get into a turf war? Or do they team up to defeat humanity? <sighs> Did you seriously bring the Ouija board again? That Ouija board has been on every single trip with us. Besides, it fits in my suitcase. I pick up a small ornament from a shelf nearby. It's a stake made out of crystal. There's no price tag attached, if you have to ask. Morgan pulls back the curtain she went through. Okay, food's ready. She comes out carrying an enormous tray that's probably also an item for sale here. On the tray are steaming bowls of some kind of soup, as well as a pitcher of water and a loaf of bread. She sets the tray down on the counter, doling out portions to each of us. Hesitantly, I try a spoonful of the soup. It's delicious. It has a rich and meaty flavor, but isn't too heavy. And it's hot, but not too hot to gulp down. I dip some of the bread into the broth. That's delicious, too. Everything here is definitely homemade. This is really, really good. Ah! Mm -hmm. This is amazing! Thanks. Let me know if you want more. Morgan stolidly keeps eating. Bray's barely seeming to register on her. It's a shame. That's probably the one nice thing I'll have to say to her all trip. When she's finished, Morgan picks up her book and starts to read again, while Tara and I are still in the middle of eating. I glance over at Tara who's very intently staring at her spoon. She finishes her bowl and rattles the spoon around a bit. Can I take you up on that refill? Of course. Without looking up, Morgan picks up both her book and her bowl and heads into the back again. She emerges the moment later with a fresh serving of soup, 
which she wordlessly sets down in front of Terra. Only after we've both taken our last bites does she finally close the book again. All done? Yeah, thanks. <sighs> I'm done too. Thank you. Let me get these out of the way then. She holds away all the dirty dishes before rejoining us at the counter. So, what are your plans for the rest of the day? I fight back the ears to tell her that she should be the one making plans for us and showing us around. At least this way I can go back to the cabin sooner. We're still figuring that out. We hadn't got to see you much, so we decided to come over. Oh, right. I'm sorry about that. I'll take a couple days off starting tomorrow. You sure? We don't want you to miss out on any business or anything. There aren't that many customers who come through. You're the first ones all week, and you don't even count. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to react to that, so I don't say anything. That's too bad. You've got a lot of cool stuff. I was looking around some while you cooked. I wouldn't get too excited. I just make up interesting stories for the items so they sound more entertaining. Uh, it helps pass the time. Right. Morgan says it so casually that there's no way she knows just how relieved I am to hear that. It lines up neatly with what I already suspected. That everything Morgan included in her email is even more made up than usual. And that this is all a colossal waste of time. Most likely she's a fan of the show who wanted to trick us into coming out here, and we fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker. If Tara has realized any of this, she of course doesn't say anything. But judging by the way her enthusiasm vanished, it seems like she's starting to get it. Again. Fiddling with some silver knickknack, she looks up from the counter to Morgan. So, can we see the talking cat? As soon as Tara's at, Tara asks, I can see Morgan's eyes light up with interest. Her hand slides away from the book she'd been about to open. Oh no. Of course. I'm sure she'd be happy to finally meet you. Her voice wavers just the smallest bit with what sounds like excitement. This first shred of emotion I've detected from her since stepping off the train. I'll go get her. Just give me one minute. Morgan exits once more, but this time through an actual door instead of a curtain. We probably could have gotten out of here without seeing the cat, you know. Why would I want to do that? This is the pizza resistance. She doesn't even try to pronounce it right. Are you serious? Still? You know it's not going to actually talk, right? I can't fathom how there's even a trace of belief rattling around in Tara's skull. Did you see her face? She's definitely not joking. Unless she's just really bad at telling jokes. That would be the most normal thing about her so far. She just told you flat out that she makes up stories and tries to get other people to believe her. How can you not see that we're getting scammed too? Come on, Maz. Try to have at least a little bit of faith. The door opens once more, and out strides Morgan. There's also the soft sound of little kitty feet on the hard wooden floor. Talking or not, the cat staring up at me is undeniably beautiful. Its white fur seemingly glistens like snow, and its eyes are a piercing azure blue. Tara leaps from her seat and crashes to her knees. The cat doesn't flinch at all, despite the commotion. Oh my god, I love her! I love her so much! She looks up at Morgan, eyes as wide as dinner plates and fingers wriggling. Can I pet her? Please tell me I can pet her. Sheladora, can she pet you? The cat doesn't say anything, of course. It does rub against Tara's waiting hand, though, causing her to let out some sort of mix between a coo and a sob. I can tell Tara just got her money's worth out of the trip. Go on, say something. 
These are the two I've been telling you about. Tara, Maddie. Morgan gestures as if introducing us to her. She looks between the cat and us expectantly. Seeing its master's attention, the cat goes from nuzzling Tara's hand to nuzzling Morgan's leg close by. She meows happily. The cat, not Morgan. Come on! You're going to make me look like an idiot if you don't say something! Morgan uses her foot to nudge the cat towards Tara, who is still crumpled on the floor. The cat indignantly tries to escape, her claws scraping uselessly against the wood. Finally, Gildura scurries away, sitting down and licking a paw. Her tail swishes rapidly as she and Morgan stare at each other. And then... Absolutely nothing. What a surprise. I'm not even disappointed, just vindicated. Even Tara's enthusiasm is gone. She coos at the cat half-heartedly, but overall she's just trying to give Morgan an out. Come on, Jeladora, they're waiting. It's like watching a car wreck. I can't look away. Morgan sticks to her act, scowling at the wholly mundane cat. It doesn't seem to phase Jeladura, who simply yawns and settles down onto the floor, just out of Tara's arm's reach. Whatever previous excitement she had just about evaporated, and is instead replaced with some kind of mixed frustration. That's when I start to realize the horrifying truth. She finally looks away from us, twisting her fingers together and gritting her teeth. When it seems like she's decided on what to say, she turns back to us. I'm sorry. I don't know why she's being so stubborn. <laughs> uh, well, you know how cats are. Tara manages an extremely fake laugh as she gets up and steps closer to me. Tara was right about one thing after all. Morgan wasn't lying to us. But now Tara's realizing where she was wrong. Morgan's also crazy. It doesn't seem like she's acting. It seems like Morgan's genuinely shocked that her cat didn't greet us by name. She talks to me all the time. I told her you two are trustworthy. That should be enough. It's... it's fine. I'm sure she's just shy. Don't worry about it. Yeah, she just met us. We've got plenty of time for her to warm up to us, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. We should probably just give her some space for now and uh, try again later. Maybe in a few days. At this point, I don't care. It's a good thing I've played along with everything so far, because it allows us to make a diplomatic exit. I guess you're right. Still, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. She'll get over herself soon enough. She glowers at the cat, who's still napping peacefully. Yeah, I'm sure. Dara steps back away from the counter and into the display area again. Anyway, thanks for lunch, Morgan. We really appreciate it. We, uh, have a couple more places we want to check out today, so we'll probably head out again. Okay, come back here when you want to ride back to the cabin. Her expression is back to unreadable. Right, sure. Thanks so much. Good to meet you, uh, Gelato. Tara waves at Gelidura, whose ear twitches, but otherwise can't be bothered to acknowledge us. The heavy door slams shut behind us as we step into the cold. I wonder if Morgan will remember to switch the sign back the other way. Outside, the wind has picked up a bit, and there are clouds starting to close in. The nice day that had been shaping up seems like it might not happen. Alright, so I'll admit that was kind of awkward. For everyone involved. Great, I'm glad you can admit it. That doesn't help us any. 
next time we see her, we just won't bring up the cat. Hopefully she won't either. We can just pretend it didn't happen. Next time? What do you think is going to happen next time? That she was saving the good cryptids for the second time we hang out? We can ask her about the spirit or the lights, that kind of thing. We get some spooky shots of the woods and we're golden. We are pros at making that kind of content interesting. Usually we have at least something to work with. She made it up. There is no dark side to this sleepy, boring mountain town. It's just a boring mountain town and she pretty much straight up admitted to that. I don't get how you aren't as upset about this as I am. We just spent thousands of dollars to fly across the whole world for a month. And the person who invited us out here is either a liar or a lunatic. It's only been a day, Mads. We've only seen a fraction of what there is to see around here. Just give it some time, all right? It's been a day, and look where that got us already. Literally every single person we talked to told us... How are you not pissed off about this? Eris shrugs. Don't you think you're being a bit harsh on Morgan? She's been super cool with us. Like, okay, yeah, the cat thing was weird, but it's not like she tried to hurt us or anything. I start to shake my head, forcing myself to cool off. I keep getting too worked up over this. I can't tell if Tara's being intentionally stubborn or what, but technically she's the one who bankrolled this whole trip. I'm still getting paid for my time here. So if she's not upset about wasting all that, then fine. I'll meet her at the train station in a month and she can do what she wants. I don't need to get so bent out of shape. Okay, you're right. Maybe she's fine. Anyway, I'm gonna go back to the cabin. Are you coming with me? Wait, already? Yeah. I've got enough to get started. Plus, I need to unpack. Oh, okay. You gonna ask Morgan to hitch up the carriage? No, it's fine. I'll walk. You sure? Yeah, I seriously don't think I could get lost in this place anymore. She seems uncertain. Probably because of my sudden mood swing. Okay, I'll probably do another lap around the village. Maybe get Morgan's input on some stuff? Okay. See you later, then. See ya. I turn and walk away, so I don't have to see her staring like a lost puppy. She'll get over it. As I head through town and back towards the path that will lead me to the cabin, I walk fast and look down for most of the way. Nobody tries to stop me or talk to me. If anyone's staring, then I don't catch it. The trip back to the cabin is easy, even though it takes me around a half hour and foot. If nothing else, I should be in pretty good shape from all the walking by the end of this trip. I spend the whole walk fantasizing about home. My comfy bed, my film collection, our cat PT. Well, technically he's Tara's cat, but I take care of him most of the time. Speaking of cats, I wonder how Tara will explain to Morgan why she's on her own. Well, that's her problem, not mine. Alone, the cabin is oppressively silent. I turn on the heater, partially just for the white noise. Soon, its rumbling fills the air. I grab an apple from the small bowl of provided food and then head back into my bedroom, setting up my laptop in bed next to me. I usually try to watch a film a day, but that's difficult when I'm traveling. Now's the perfect time to catch up, though. I open up my library and start scrolling through, looking for something I haven't seen before. Ideally a comedy, or at least something with a happy ending. I've just gotten through the elves when there's a knock at the front door. I nearly dropped my apple. Who could be knocking? Karen and Morgan both had their own keys. The knocking comes again just seconds later. Whoever's out there is super impatient. My heart pumps in my chest. What if we're being cased for a robbery or something? 
I hide my laptop under the blanket so that I hurry into the living room. There's a third knock, right as I reach the door, and I peer, peek outside to see a shock of orange hair. It isn't Morgan, but instead her mother. I open the door, right as she prepares for her fourth knock. Just how fast does she think I can walk? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Madison, wasn't it? That's right. I'm coming in. She pushes past me, not even giving time to fully realize it wasn't a question. Well, I guess she does technically own the place. Inside, Evelyn surveys the area slowly and impassively, as if judging our taste in luggage and belongings. Uh, how can I help you? I wanted to make good on our promise from last night to talk. Please, have a seat. She moves some of the stuff on the couch, gesturing for me to sit. I obey, too taken aback to do anything else. How has your first day in Eisenfeld been? I trust you found everyone very accommodating and everything to your liking? It was fine. Everyone's been very kind to us. I wonder if she'd be surprised at how the villagers treated us. It seems better just to pretend everything went well, for the sake of not offending our host. Good, good. Where's the other one? The other... what? The other one with you, Tara. Oh, she's still at Morgan's shop, I think. Evelyn raises an eyebrow, though her eyes betray no curiosity. Looks like a purely symbolic motion. Is she now? I assume then that you found something not to your liking there. Her gaze is piercing, and I absentmindedly tug at my scarf. I can't get a read on her, neither her intentions nor her feelings. It was fine. I just wanted to come back early so I could take a nap and get started editing the footage we took. I hope my lie is convincing. I don't want to tell her that I think her daughter's crazy. She doesn't seem to question it. I see, I see. Did she show you that awful cat? Geradora? Yes, so she did. I hate that creature. Oh, always underfoot, getting in the way. I just sit quietly, not sure how to respond. Anyway, <laughs> Madison, please tell me about yourself. <laughs> I didn't have much forewarning about your arrival, so I'm rather in the dark. Her tone is suddenly friendly, but not warm. She smiles, but it doesn't seem to fit her mouth. Her lips seem to stretch a bit too wide. I'm probably just imagining it. As concisely as I can, I tell her about Terra Normal and the kinds of things we investigate. Throughout it all, she doesn't express any opinion one way or the other. Just nods occasionally. And what brought you to Eisenfeld? I hesitate. How much has Morgan told her? Anything? Morgan told us that there are a lot of ghost stories and legends around here. Lights in the forest at night and whatnot. Tara really liked the sound of a vacation out here. Evelyn sighs deeply. It's jarringly melodramatic after her total apathy during my explanation. That daughter of mine. <laughs> Always lying and making up ridiculous tales. It's been the same her entire life. Hysterically dragging people into her fantasies. That's something I've never been able to knock out of her. She shakes her head sadly, standing up from the chair she'd been occupying. I'm sorry to say that uh, you're simply the most recent victims of her lies. It's a pity, but you won't be finding anything like that out here. <laughs> Besides, it's dangerous to go into the forest, especially at night. And we wouldn't want anything to happen to you, after all. After all, that's why we have the rules that we do. For the safety of everyone. 
I hope you'll enjoy the rest of your time here in Eisenfeld, though. As disappointing as it might be. It's nearly the exact same thing that the people we interviewed in the village itself said. It's almost like they rehearsed the answer in advance. With long, deliberate strides, Evelyn crosses the living room to the front door. I'm sure I'll see you again. She doesn't wait for me to respond. She just leaves, the door slamming shut behind her. I sit in silence for a while, unsure what to make of it all. So, Morgan's own mom thinks she's as ridiculous as I had suspected the whole time. That's pretty damning. So, I doubt it will change Tara's mind about anything. I'll have to let her know when she comes home. I stand up and head for my bedroom, passing by the chair that Evelyn had been sitting in. As they go, for a moment, I swear that I felt feel a breeze, frigid and cold. But the moment the thought crosses my mind, the sensation is gone, like it was never there. Shivering, I return to my warm bed and laptop into a long overdue break. Hours later, I hear the sound of the front door opening and closing. I peek out of my bedroom, worried that it might be the mayor letting herself in again. It's just Tara, though. Alone. It's been a few hours since we parted ways, and I'm not as annoyed with her anymore. So even though I'm kind of tempted to just put in my headphones and ignore her, I get up and head into the living room. She stands at the sink flipping through a notebook. I knock on the edge of my door frame as I enter, so that she can hear me coming. Hey. Hey. Rather than looking at me, she keeps reading her notebook. Well, pretending to. There's no way she could actually be reading as fast as she's turning the pages. I decide not to call her on it. No point in starting another fight. How'd it go? About the same. Is that good or bad? She doesn't respond. She must be really upset about this morning. It's not like she's being unreasonable. Now that I've had some time to rest and recuperate, I feel kind of bad about being so harsh towards her and Morgan. Morgan's mom came by earlier. That gets her attention. She shuts the book and looks around. Gotcha. Really? What for? Just wanted to introduce herself. I told her a bit about who we are and what the show's about. What did she think? I don't know. She didn't really say much. She was really weird. Like in a different way than Morgan. She seemed really... intense, I guess. What I mostly remember is how she was glaring the whole time. It never seemed like she was anything other than angry about something. Smugly, Tara holds up the notebook she was just perusing. I know you're gonna call BS, but Morgan was telling me a lot of stuff about her mom. Like, some seriously crazy stuff. You wanna read it? She offers me the notebook. It hangs limply, a giant frown in the air. She's used that thing for so long that it's lost all its rigidness. I shake my head. I'll take your word for it. I've heard enough crazy stuff from Morgan for one day. I don't need to feel I don't need to hear theories on how her mom is actually the spawn of Satan or something. Figured. Make any progress with the new vid? Not really. We're gonna need more footage before there's enough to really get started. That mean you're coming with us from now on, or what? Yeah. I will. Sorry for being bitchy earlier. Again. Don't sweat it. She strikes a pose. Just make sure to bring your A-game. I roll my eyes, but I'm smiling. Even though we bicker a lot, I'm truly grateful that it's always easily patched up. Yeah, yeah. 
I can't promise that I'll buy into a word of what Morgan says, but the least I can do is try to be polite about it. The tension resolved, Tara yawns and flaps her notebook at me again. All right, well, I'm gonna hit the hay soon. What about you? I'll probably watch a film first. I'm not that tired yet. How many times can you watch 2001 without getting sick of it? I don't know, but I intend to find out. Tara and I each head back to our bedrooms. As I go, I feel a bit better about everything. Just because I'm quitting the show doesn't, want my, doesn't mean I want to lose Tara as my best friend. We've been friends for over a decade, so of course we've had our disagreements and arguments. I think the longest we've ever gone without talking was a month. Still, over the last few days, it's felt like we've been coming dangerously close to saying something that goes too far. Either one of us. And thinking back on today, I can't really pretend that I'm not the one who is mostly at fault. Even when I'm aware that I'm losing my cool, sometimes it feels like it's hard to stop. Tara totally has it coming, though. At least some of the time. From now on, I will be better. I won't let myself be as obnoxious as I was today. For everyone's sake. I climb into bed and set up my laptop. Getting comfy. In the dark with my headphones in. It doesn't take too long to immerse myself in the familiar feeling of a film that I love. That's what I appreciate about movies. No matter the circumstances, they can help you escape. My eyes are getting heavy, and I pull the blanket up to my chin. The computer is balanced in just the right spot to not fall off the bed. All things considered, it's a cozier setup than I could have hoped for from my cabin out in the woods. Sure, the Wi-Fi is bad, but it gives me an excuse to catch up on my backlog. Everything's perfect to fall asleep. <laughs> the sound of something knocking on my window makes me leap up. It's past midnight. There shouldn't be anyone here. Maybe it's a bird or a squirrel or something. I'm wearing lying, I'm not able to see. Should I yell for Tara? Nah, not until I know what it is. It's just some wildlife, as is probably the case. She'd never let me live it down. Still, my heart pounds as I slam my laptop shut, killing the only source of light. About it, the room is pitch black, dark enough that I can't see what's at the window, but hopefully it can't see me either. If this turns out to just be a lost rodent or something, I'm gonna feel real stupid. I stalk over to the window, prepared to cut and run if I need to. Slowly, slowly, I raise myself up to eye level. Oh. <laughs> Morgan is pressed against the window pane, looking into my room with one hand resting against the glass. You have a minute? God damn it. The tension drains out of me. Replaced immediately with exhaustion. I should have known. You couldn't knock? I did. I rub my temples and sigh. She's technically correct. The worst kind of correct. Okay, I guess I have a minute. But if you're going to come in and talk, please use the door. Of course. I'm not going to climb through the window. Color me shocked. I head into the living room and hesitate in front of Tara's door. Should I knock? Knowing her, she's probably already asleep. I've always been jealous of her ability to pass out instantly. I decide to leave it up to Nor Morgan. There must be a reason she knocked in my window, not Tara's. I unlock the front door and let Morgan in. She's waiting with a thermos of coffee in her hands, like usual. Sorry to bother you. I know it's late. It's fine. I was still awake. Not for much longer, ideally, but I keep that to myself. Were you working on the video? Nah, just watching a film before bed. 
Can't do much until we have more footage. And even then, I left most of my setup back in the U.S. We sit down in the couches, just like her mother and I did earlier. For all her faults, at least Morgan isn't as terrifying as her mom is. Does Tara help with the video work at all? Not really. I've tried to teach her stuff once or twice, but she's not interested in learning. That sounds like her. Yeah. I'm a little put off by Morgan already feeling like she knows Tara and what she's like. I guess that's a result of watching someone online for so long. You start to think you know what they're like, even though you only ever see one side of them. We get it a lot, so I'm kind of used to it. Sometimes it can become a bigger problem, though. People think they're entitled to us acting a certain way because they've seen it online. Fortunately, Morgan hasn't been that way at all. Yet. I do wish she'd get to the point of why she's here, though. But instead, she gets up and heads to the kitchen area, retrieving a coffee mug from the cabinet without ever turning on the lights. I twist around to watch as she pours some of the coffee from her thermos into the mug, and then loads that into the microwave. Must not be a very effective thermos. At least she's polite enough to make sure the microwave door doesn't slam. She leans against the counter, barely visible to me. Tara told me that you're leaving the show after this trip is over. Of course she did. I must have made a face because Morgan clears her throat loudly. Sorry, was it supposed to be a secret? Nah, it's fine. But yeah, that's the idea. I'll go back and finish school. I see. That's a shame. I know you hate when it happens, but I've always enjoyed the moments where you're on camera. <laughs> Thanks. I'm just camera shy. Ironic, I know. She's yanked me on screen enough times that I'm a bit used to it by now, though. Morgan hits a stop button on the microwave a second before it dings. She retrieves her coffee and returns to the couch. But I guess that's why things seemed a bit tense between the two of you, right? Before I can answer, she shakes her head. Actually, sorry. That's none of my business. You're fine. It's that obvious, huh? A bit. You seem tense whenever I see you. That's actually the main reason I came by. I promise it wasn't just to be nosy. I was starting to wonder. I came by to say that I'm sorry. I know that you're also uncomfortable around me. She says it as nonchalantly as if she was telling me about the weather. I bite my lip. I mean, she's not wrong, but I don't want to just say that. It's okay. You don't have to spare my feelings. I guarantee I've been called worse than whatever it is you're thinking. It's just that I'd sleep better tonight if I cleared the air between us first. She takes a long sip of coffee that should be hot enough to scald her mouth. I can't fathom how she could sleep at all, or if she even needs to anymore. I mean, I... It's nothing like that. Nothing personal, really. I'm just... a cynic, I guess? If it makes you feel any better, I'm the same way for pretty much every episode. You just get the behind-the-scenes experience this time. Morgan shrugs. I can't blame you for thinking I'm crazy or full of shit. But I can promise you that I'm not stupid. It takes me a beat to realize that was a joke. <laughs> it's fine. I'm always the skeptical one out of the two of us, after all. There's just... a lot going on. Like you heard. So I'm sort of a mess all around right now. It's not your fault. I half laugh. <laughs> At least not entirely. She smiles thinly, seeming to appreciate my bluntness. To be perfectly honest, you weren't really what we were expecting, either. She sets the coffee down, looking interested. Really? Yeah, we were prepared for someone super fangirly and, like, all over Terra. Like, annoyingly so. Not... Not me. Right. Even in your email, you seemed a bit more... 
I don't know how not to say this rudely. Interesting, engaging, not monotone. More energetic. Oof, she saves me again. Yeah, pretty much. The emails that we had exchanged back home had lots of smiley faces, exclamation points, and other cheery touches. In person, however, seeing Morgan smile at all is a rarity on its own. That makes sense. I wasn't trying to trick the two of you or anything. It's just easier to be open like that online, I guess. I understand. That much, at least, I really can empathize with. I know that you don't know me, and that so far, I haven't given you any real reason to trust me or believe me. But I hope that you'll at least give it a chance. Terranormal is really important to me. I've been a fan for years. But I'm not the type of person who would invite you to the middle of nowhere just to meet Terra. I invited you out here for a reason, and I'm confident in that reason. But I understand that you'll need more proof than that. I wait to see if she has more to say, but that seems to be it. Thank you for telling me all this, though. I really do appreciate it. And I'm sorry for being so dismissive. It'd be nice to be wrong for once. So, I hope that we do find all that stuff you talked about. I really do. Tomorrow night, I was going to show Tara around the woods a bit. Would you like to come along? Yeah, I'll be there. I don't especially like the idea of wandering the forest at night, but I can't exactly say no after I just promised to be more agreeable. She nods and takes a careful swig of her coffee. Then she stands. Cool. Anyway, that's all I had to say. I'll get out of your hair now so you can get some rest. She heads for the door and throws it open without waiting for a response. The temperature plummets right away, and she turns back. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it too. But just so you know, I'll prove you wrong. She closes the door and disappears into the night. We head to the appointed meeting spot right at the turn of the hour. Even during the day, the forest felt hostile and foreign. But now, at night, it's downright scary. Each rattle of a branch is a demon's footsteps. Every gust of wind is a monster's breath. I stand closer to Terra, treading on the backs of her feet several times. I think this is supposed to be the place. I look around the area, it's indistinguishable from the rest of the woods. My only comfort is a tiny pinprick of light that represents our cabin, back at the forest's edge. A feeling of dread creeps its way up my spine. What if this is a trap or a setup? Maybe Morgan's just lured us out here in the middle of nowhere and is waiting out of sight with a knife in hand or something. Considering we traveled thousands of kilometers to get here, it's a trick we fell for it hard. Maybe we're early. I know that we're not. Tara sweeps the fret flashlight around, illuminating a few identical trees before the light beam peters off into oblivion. Maybe we should just go back. The light passes over Morgan, suddenly a meter away from us. Tara jolts backwards, crashing into me. The flashlight plummets to the ground, bouncing once before stopping. I keep my balance, barely, and catch Tara's arm to stop her from falling. Are you okay? Short term? Yeah. But I think I just lost ten years. <sighs> what about you, Mads? I'm fine. What on earth were you doing? Me? I was waiting for you. Where? Didn't you hear us? Just over there. Sorry, I had headphones in and missed you. You were just standing in the dark? In a forest? Wearing headphones? <laughs> yes? Why? 
had a lot for words I can only shrug. Does hanging out alone in the dark in the middle of nowhere not register as weird for Morgan? He just spooked us is all, no worries. She stoops down and retrieves the flashlight from the snow, drawing it on her sleeve. She brushes off the snow the same way she brushes off Morgan's actions. Anyway, it's all good. What now? Morgan turns and faces the trees, shining her flashlight across them. I thought we could walk around a little. It might help you to get a better feel for the area. Behind Morgan's back, Tara and I exchange a look of concern. Tara gives me the slightest of shrugs. I'm still reluctant, but I nod. If Morgan's planning to kill us, it's not like it'll make a difference whether she does does it here or in the forest. And I'm pretty sure she's not a murderer anyway. Sure, lead on. Morgan sets off without another word, and we follow just a couple paces back. Are we going somewhere in particular? <sighs> not really. I doubt you want to go too far this late at night, right? Right. That's fine. We'll stick to the edge then. As we walk, Morgan keeps her flashlight pointed straight ahead in the direction that we're going. Tara, on the other hand, swings hers around, looking up trees and out into the abyss. She and I only brought one flashlight with us. The spare is sitting in one of our suitcases back at the cabin. I regret leaving it behind, just on the off chance that we somehow get separated. So, did you learn anything useful today? Not really. We went around town some, but... But most people didn't really want to talk? Yeah. How'd you know? That's how it is around here. People are mistrustful. I was kind of surprised by that. Figured with how out of the way it is here that we might have been, I don't know... Treated like celebrities? Hey now, don't project. But something like that. It's more like they isolate themselves by choice. We have internet and TV. It's just that lots of people choose not to use them. I'm guessing they probably had some not so nice things to say about me too, right? Neither Tara nor I respond. Our silence lasts a bit too long. It's okay. I'm used to it. You don't have to pretend or anything. Light shines in our faces as Morgan turns around, half smiling. Hey, you two don't need another assistant back where you live or anything, right? Uh... My mouth flaps like a fish while I try to think of a diplomatic response, but then Morgan laughs and faces forward again. Just kidding. We trek on in awkward silence. I'm not even sure what we're supposed to be doing or looking for. We're just wandering in the dark, trusting that Morgan knows how to get back to the cabin. It's cold and my feet are sore, and I'm once again regretting coming to Eisenfeld. I gently tug Tara's sleeve, right by her elbow. When she looks at me, I silently gesture back towards where we came from and shrug, hoping she'll get the message. Now, she mouths back. I nod. She gives a worried look over towards Morgan, who's now slightly farther away. Tara holds up five fingers. Five more minutes. Sighing, I nod again. We hurry to catch back up with Morgan. Something wrong? Oh no, Maddie, uh, had something in her shoe. Oh. It's hard to tell if she buys it. I wouldn't. Mentally, I'm counting backwards from five minutes, already imagining the comfort of my bed and blanket back at the cabin. How I'm going to survive a whole month of this is an issue for future me to worry about. I got lost out in this part of the forest once. Three minutes and 32 seconds. Three minutes and 31 seconds. Don't worry, though. I know my way around now. Yeah, they mentioned something about that. I step on Tara's foot again, this time totally on purpose. I thought they might. Her tone is still completely nonchalant, 
At least Morgan seems impossible to offend. It's too bad it looks like it's going to snow tonight. We probably shouldn't stay out too late. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, that's... That's too bad. I'm sorry this was so disappointing. I'd hoped that there would be more to see. What exactly were you expecting? It's the middle of the night. Come on, Mads. It's about the atmosphere. It's way spookier out here when it's dark. I know. That's half the problem. We can turn back now if you'd like. Before I can agree, Tara shakes her head. Nah, let's give it a couple more minutes. You came out all this way for us after all. I glare at Tara, but I think she misses it. I've lost track of my countdown, too. Whatever. The small, apologetic smile that I barely noticed does little to assuage my discomfort. We traipse aimlessly through the snow for a while longer. I stare at my feet more than at the path ahead, and simply follow in the footsteps left behind by the other two. So I nearly slam into Terra, who's come to a complete halt yet again. What now? I saw something. You did? Terra, stop messing around. Let's. No, I mean it. I saw something. I shut up. I can tell by her tone that she's serious. She saw something, or at least she thinks she did. The three of us turn and face the way she is. It's even deeper into the forest, barely lit by the moon. There was a light. Someone else walking around? There shouldn't be anyone out at this time of night. It's dangerous to be in the woods once it gets late. I opt to not point out the obvious hypocrisy. It was probably moonlight or something. It wasn't the moon, Maddie. There's something out there. Both of them point their flashlights in the direction Dare is looking. Aside from more trees, there's nothing to be seen. Tara? Maddie. She grins. This is what we're here for. Come on! Tara breaks into a run, leaving Morgan and I behind in surprise. We exchange a look before Morgan runs off after her. I have no choice but to go, too. The regret is almost instant. Cold knives pierce my lungs with each heavy breath. I'm not in the best shape to begin with, and the snow and boots don't make things any easier. The only consolation is that we're running in a straight line, so it won't be hard to follow our path back. Every so often, we pause to catch our breath. The pace is catching up to Terra, too, who has to fight to keep her smile on. Morgan seems unfazed by it all. I'm about three seconds away from demanding that we give up when I see it. Way off into the distance, too far to identify the source, is a light. It sparkles and glimmers like a star that fell to earth. I fall silent, the words stolen from my mouth. Then Terra points, stating what we already know. There it is! Buoyed by her second win, Terra runs off again. This time, Morgan and I are close behind. We follow the light, which sometimes blinks out, but soon reappears. I'm too focused on not s slipping and falling to give much thought as to the source. There's no telling how long or how far we've been going. Somehow, the light never seems to get any closer or farther away. It's like it's running from us. Hey, wait up! Tara yells out into the darkness. If whatever it is can understand her, it ignores her. Running is quickly becoming difficult. My lungs burn from the cold, and my breathing turns ragged after barely a minute. Tara pulls further and further ahead from Morgan and me, her one track mind fixated on that light. 
after a bit longer, I hit my limit. And my pace slows back to a walk, then a stop. I fold over, hands on my knees, as I gasp for breath. Morgan crunches to a stop just ahead, too, turning back towards me. Are you alright? I try to respond, but I'm breathing too heavily to be able to talk. I just wave my hands, gesturing for Morgan to go on ahead without me. But she doesn't. Are you sure? I force myself to stand and nod. I'm... fine. In the murk, Tara's become a disembodied light herself, only the flashlight's glow visible. I watch it bounce to a halt, and then slowly make its way back towards us. You guys give up too easily. How are you not dead? I haven't seen you run in years. That's cause you never hit the gym with me. I don't know if she's joking or not, and I'm too worn out to care. So, what was that thing? Do you think it was your forest spirit? Morgan's eyes widen. You believe me? Tara shrugs. I'm considering it at least. I mean, what else could it have been? Fairies. Morgan says it very nonchalantly. I side-eye Tara, who is very interested in her boots. The forest spirit doesn't really make a light like that. At least, not that I'm aware of. Right, that makes sense. Doesn't it, Mads? It was probably someone from the village. But, as I say it, I know how unlikely that is. The way the light seemed to always maintain a precise distance was unnatural. I can feel the seeds of doubt being sown in my heart. But it was definitely strange. Tara looks at me with more pride than a rainbow flag. Hey, holy shit! That's practically canon in Maddie terms. I roll my eyes, but it's partially just for show. I'm curious, at the very least. I wouldn't call myself a believer as much as Tara wishes. But, that's two strange things so far, which is two more than I expected when I boarded the train out here. It was strange. That's as much as I'll A yawn overtakes me in the middle of speaking. It doesn't help the pain in my lungs. Oh, guess it's past your bedtime, huh? I kick some snow at her, and it bounces uselessly off her pants. With the way we've been bantering with each other, it really does feel a bit more like old times. Make the three strange things on this trip so far. We should begin heading back anyway. We can't go much further in before I'd be lost too. You still know where we are? Yes, of course. We'd be in trouble if not. She has a point. I got so caught up chasing the light. I lost track of what direction we'd come from. I'll show you around more tomorrow. There's something you might like to see. Yeah? What is it? A surprise. We'll go tomorrow before it gets dark. It's a bit of a walk. Does it have to do with whatever that light was? I have no idea. It's possible. Story of my life. Okay, well, we'll call it quits for tonight and pick back up tomorrow? Yeah. I guess. That's fine by me. Great! She hops forward, then pauses. Uh, guess you ought to lead the way. Morgan smiles as she does just that. It takes us only 15 minutes or so to reach the cabin. We must have added a lot of time to our trip with all the wandering we did. Morgan bids us farewell at the door, which I barely returned before stumbling inside. I'm halfway out of my boots by the time Tara's inside. Guess you're not staying up late then. I'm out like a light the second I hit the bed. Tara grins, just briefly. Right. My hand is on the doorknob when Tara clears her throat. <clears throat> hey, thanks for, you know, 
chasing after that thing. I appreciate you playing along. My hand lingers on the door, poised to turn. Yeah, of course. Let's see what we find tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Right. Good night. Night. I quickly step in and then shut my bedroom door before Tara can say anything else. As I switch off the lights and crawl into bed, I remember the end of the train ride here. I felt the same just now, standing there and not knowing what to say. It would be so easy. I banish those thoughts from my mind and wrench my eyes shut. There'll be time to worry about it tomorrow. I have time to think. We have a month. As I slowly drift off to sleep, the exhaustion that I feel winning out over the stress. The last thoughts I have are of dancing lights in the snow. We start to fall into a bit of a routine. Every day, Tara and I will get up and explore Eisenfeld or the surrounding area a bit. We never go too far into the forest, but just enough to set up some dramatic camera angles, or to film some monologue segments for Tara. Once Mori is done with work, she'll join us or show us around. Sometimes she brings her cat with her. Surprise, surprise, still hasn't said a word. She keeps promising it eventually will, though. Ever since the night we saw the light in the trees, we've been hoping to encounter something equally mysterious or interesting. No such luck, though. <laughs> any sort of hope or excitement that I had, any bit of belief that I'd allow myself to build up, went squashed back down to resigned indifference. My trademark, I know. It took about a week of this before Morgan asked us to wait for her at the cabin, saying she was finally ready to show us that thing she mentioned. She still wasn't any more forthcoming with what it was, but over the week we'd known Morgan, I'd gotten a little more comfortable with the idea. If she was going to leave us in a shallow grave or something, she'd had plenty of opportunities to do that already. The heavy clouds overhead promise a darker night than the past few, and probably heavier snowfall. We won't be able to stay out very late. Even with Morgan's guidance, the possibility of being caught in a snowstorm is hard to ignore. Tara paces back and forth outside as I linger in the doorway, trying to enjoy the warmth from the cabin for as long as I can. Finally, a fashionable 15 minutes late, I spot Morgan heading down the trail from the village towards us. Tara zips off to intercept her and the two of them approach together. Hey, sorry I'm late. Work was a little busy tonight. No worries. Well, that answers one of the myths of Eisenfeld that I was curious about. Whether or not anyone ever actually shops at Morgan's store. Here it bounces around between the two of us, raring to get going. Morgan smiles approvingly at her. So... You said you had something special planned for tonight, right? She spent the whole day trying to guess what it is. I think I've narrowed it down. It's either a crashed UFO, the Fountain of Youth, or Elvis. Those are the ones you narrowed it down to? <sighs> Someday, Mads, it's gonna be Elvis, and you're going to wish you'd believe me. I face Morgan, pointedly turning my back to Tara. Anyway, we're ready to go if you are. Do you both have flashlights? We're going to be heading a bit deeper into the woods this time. We both hold up our lights in unison. After our first venture into the forest together, there's no way I'm ever going out there without us each having a flashlight. Just having one makes me feel more self-reliant. It helps suppress my anxiety a little bit. Just a little. Great. Follow me. We circle back around the cabin and head into the woods. I've been waiting to show you two this since you got here. You're going to love it. 
Tara starts to vibrate again, clearly soaking up the suspense. As much as I hate to admit it, she's got me pretty curious too. I'm not sure what she could be keeping secret at here and for so long. This isn't going to be dangerous or anything, right? Um, probably not. I like those odds. He set off at a fairly brisk pace. Tara makes it a point to walk right by Morgan's side, taking short and hurried strides. If she doesn't find out where we're going soon, I'm pretty sure she might actually explode. Okay, I'm gonna keep guessing. Ancient graveyard, fairy circle, satanic ritual, Sasquatch den? Close. It's a church. Tara stops dead in her tracks. Wait, a church? Was Maddie right when she said you were going to try to get us to join a cult? I never said that. I might have said that. Despite our antics, Morgan never stops or slows down. Nothing like that, I promise. It's really old. Older than any of the buildings you've seen in Eisenfeld. The people who built it are ancestors of the residents today. I guess they were what you'd consider pagans. They worshipped a god of the forest. Whoa. I expect more to the story, but that seems to be Morgan's stopping point for now. She focuses on the path to instead, swinging her lantern around in an arc as she looks for whatever it is that's telling her where to go. Every single tree around me looks identical, but I guess one of them is a little more special than the rest. When she sees whichever one that is, she starts to lead us on again. My glasses started fogging up a bit more as we walk. I should have insisted that Tara lay her up a bit more. I'd be a pretty crappy friend if I let her freeze to death out here. So, to summarize, your great-great-whatevers and the rest of the villagers built an old church out in the forest to worship a giant forest spirit, and that's what we're going to see right now? Right. Have I mentioned that this is going to be the best episode of the show ever? Morgan's got Tara hanging on to her every word. Hook, line, and sinker. I'm glad she's having a good time, at least. No thanks to me. You said it's older than the rest of the village. Do you know how old? Centuries, at least. I don't know how many. I've done some research on the history of Eisenfeld, but none of the books really mention it. How'd you learn about it, then? A lot of it comes from old journals, or other documents left behind by the people who used to live here. Parts of it are passed down as family legends, too. The image of Evelyn and Morgan sitting cozily by a fire while Evelyn tells stories is one that I can't imagine actually happened. We're not gonna pry into the details of that, though. You think we could take a look at those journals sometime? Maybe we could show them off on the show. Authentic first-hand accounts, or something like that. Eh, for some reason, now Morgan stops, looking ponderous. I also realize that it's starting to snow. Just barely, but enough to make me bite my lip and watch the sky. I'd be happy to show you. Score! You're seriously the best. Like, thanks for doing all this. It's nothing, really. Don't all your hosts do the same? A lot of them only stick around for the first day or two. Then once they realize there's a lot of filming and setting up behind the scenes, they get bored. For all her issues, I can't deny that Morgan's been a much more gracious and helpful host than we're used to. We walk in silence for a little bit. Oh wow, snow continues to fall. Getting heavier and heavier. At first I try to ignore it, but it's hard. Like always, it seems it'll fall to me to be the responsible one. Hey, Morgan? Are you sure it's safe to keep going? It's starting to snow pretty hard. Both of them look up as if they hadn't noticed. Oh, you're right. Hmm. Now, it's Morgan who turns around and looks back the way we came. I can practically hear the gears turning in her head. Tara watches, looking anxious. 
Oh, so she only worries if Morgan starts to look uncomfortable. It's going to get bad pretty soon. She says it so matter-of-factly that at the first, the severity of her words don't register. Then, every single alarm bell in my head starts ringing. What? How soon is pretty soon? And how bad? I'd say within the next half hour. Those clouds don't look good. That's an understatement. They seem to be moving almost impossibly fast. Just like that, the weather has gone from a light snow to the start of a blizzard. We need to turn back then. Back to the cabin. I take a couple of steps, but the fresh snow has made it harder to walk. Even the trail that we just left has been partially obscured. We're closer to the church than the cabin. I think we should go there and wait it out. Wait it out? What if it doesn't just pass by? What if we're stuck there for days? It's better than being dead, you know. I turned to her in disbelief. No shit it is! Morgan wrings her hands, looking genuinely distressed. I don't know what's going on. I don't think it was... Once again, she looks back in the direction we came from, lost in thought. We're just wasting time standing here arguing, you know. Morgan said we should go to the church, and she's the expert. I'm loath to call her an expert at this point, but Tara's right that we don't have time to spare. We're definitely in dire straits if she's the one being the voice of reason. Fine, let's get going then. We don't waste any more energy on talking. We just follow Morgan as closely as we can. The light from her bounces in the wind, reminiscent of the light we followed just a few short days ago. I focus on it, using it as a beacon, since it's easier to keep track of than Morgan herself. I bury my face into my scarf as much as I can, feeling the wind push against me and making it harder to walk. By now, the world around us is starting to grow more and more blurry. It'll be a whiteout before long. My heart beats hard in my chest as my anxiety starts to skyrocket. We keep walking, huddling closer together as we press on. Tara keeps a brave face, but she's shuddering more with each step. Morgan and I push a little closer to her, hoping to help shield her from the wind as much as we can. When we get back, if we get back, I'm not letting her take another step outside until she agrees to start wearing something warmer. After what feels like years, we come to a stop. My legs are leaden with the effort of marching through the snow. I'm afraid that Morgan's going to say that we're lost, but then I realize that we've arrived. Just ahead, a huge stone building stands tall. For its supposed age, it looks remarkably intact. The howling winds buffet it, but even from here, it looks infinitely safer than being stuck out here. A pair of massive wooden doors loom before us. Just give me one second and I'll get this open. She grabs the hold of the door and starts to pull. The freezing wind works against her, and for a tense moment, I worry that she wouldn't be able to get them open. But then, with a creak that's audible even in this weather, they slide open to let us in. After you. We don't need telling twice. Tara and I hurry inside, with Morgan letting the door slam shut behind her as she follows. The first thing that strikes me is the temperature. An old stone building in the middle of a blizzard should be frigid, frigid but it's not. In fact, it's almost warm. Mads, we hit the jackpot! Her shout reverberates around the massive chamber, leaving a faint echo in its wake. When Morgan said a church, I figured it would be just some small wooden shack with a tacked on steeple. But this... Tara's flashlight beam dances wildly along the walls as she spins in circles. Trying to take in every last detail all at once. 
This is nothing short of incredible. I let my light drift as well, but slowly enough that I can actually take the time to process what I'm seeing. The whole interior is remarkably well preserved. A few broken pews, a couple pieces of collapsed stone, and a layer of dust on nearly every surface are the only things that make this place seem anything less than brand new. Looking closer at the building itself, I can see various flourishes or designs decorating the walls and railings. Whoever built this place, they built it as a labor of love. The centerpiece is a massive stained glass window that dominates the center of the far wall. Its brilliant colors form an intricate pattern. I make my way over to Morgan, who's currently watching Tara dart around the building with a small, satisfied smile. It dissipates as I approach. Even though I'm relieved to be out of the storm, I can't believe we ended up in this situation in the first place. Before I can say anything though, she beats me to it. I'm really sorry about this. I truly am. If I'd thought the weather would turn so foul, I'd have never suggested we come out here. The last thing I want to do is place you and Tara in any danger. I just wanted to show the two of you something tangible. Something different. I swallow my harsh words. Chastising her wouldn't do us any good. Plus, she's right that the weather changed way faster than I would have expected, or even thought possible. So I just rub my shoulders, trying to massage some warmth back into them. Won't apologize yet. There's still plenty of time for us to die of starvation or something like that. I think it's more likely that we die of exposure first. Well, that's reassuring. Suddenly, a beam of light swipes across my face. It comes from Terra on the other side of the building. Hey, come check out these books. Morgan and I both start to head over. By the way, how do you keep it so warm in here? I was looking for a heater or something, but couldn't find one. It's magic, I think. You know what? I'm not even gonna argue. Tara's waiting excitedly next to a stack of books. That's probably a first. Check it out. The wooden shelves are warped and damaged beyond repair, but have still retained their shape pretty well. The books that line them are in a similar condition. When I remove one, its once soft cover is cold and rigid, and the text is faded into illegibility. But, flipping through the pages, a few of them are still readable. Or at least would be if I could understand the language. Tell me these aren't filled with ancient incantations or something. These aren't filled with ancient incantations. She holds up a book to her face and blows a puff of air towards me, filling my face with dust. I wrinkle my nose, coughing and sputtering. <laughs> hey, what the hell? You don't know what's floating around in here? You're literally the only person alive who could be in a haunted church and not care at all. She never said it was haunted, you know? And I'm sorry that I'm still a bit too shaken up over, you know, almost dying in a snowstorm? We weren't ever in any real danger, I'm sure. Isn't that right, Morgan? Actually, I wasn't sure we were going to make it here. Tara's eyes widen. The reality of the situation hitting her at last. Then, she grins. That makes this an even more badass story for the vlog. Mads, you'll have to go hard on the wind sound effects. Maybe we should set the camera outside, get some footage of the blizzard? She hurries over to where I'd abandoned the camera on one of the pews and picks it up, dancing around as she frames mock shots. I open my mouth to tell her how dumb that is, when a trickle of dust spirals past me. The whole church shakes with a slight tremor, and more dust is displaced. 
earthquake? That would be the icing on this cake. It would also be horrifically ironic if we survived the, bl the blizzard only to die in a freak earthquake. Something tells me that's not what this is, though. There's another tremor, slightly stronger this time, and with it a distant boom, like someone shooting a cannon in the forest. The three of us exchange a glance, silently. But once, even Terra is silent. Ooh. The stained glass window rattles. I hear Morgan suck in a breath. When I look at her, her eyes are wild and confused. Ooh. The thunderous sound is getting closer. Then there's another sound, a blistering crack that I recognize as tree splintering. No winds, no matter how strong, should be able to do that. Wordlessly, Tara heads over to the front doors. Though my first instinct is to call her back to what I hope is safety, I find myself more curious than afraid. I have to know what it is. I have to see it. Morgan lingers behind us, unsure of what to say or do. Tara reaches the doors and presses her shoulder against it. She pushes the door open, just a crack. Or at least she tries to. But the terrifying wind catches and rips the doors all the way open, as if presenting the scene before us. I struggle to comprehend what I'm seeing. Tall, taller than even than the trees, stands what I can only describe as a monster. Two enormous, luminous red eyes peer out across black expanse of the night sky. Neither the howling winds nor the biting snow seem to affect it at all. Oh my god. That... that's not possible! This can't be happening. This can't be real. My legs are about to collapse under me. My heart drops like a rock in my chest. Every heartbeat sends a rush of blood through my body, so strong it drowns out the cacophonous storm. Tara <coughs> fumbles with the camera, her hands shaking violently. Cursing, trembling, she struggles to lift it up to her face, repeatedly losing her grip as she tries to focus on the thing in front of us. I don't know how she can even have the presence of mind to do that. My thoughts are a blur as my mind does its best to process what I'm seeing. It's like the forest itself come to life. Like a whole mass of trees just uprooted themselves from the ground to form something that can't possibly exist. Branches twist and contort into each other. One tree splits into ten. Wood rotting into decay and growing anew again, spin from the impossible red center. Two immense horns pierce the sky, looking like lightning bolts permanently imprinted against the clouds. Every thought that I can manage to form is fleeting. Every rational part of me tells me what I'm seeing shouldn't exist, that it isn't possible. Yet, here it is. Undeniable. All I can do is stare. The red glows brightly, burning my eyes like it's staring right back at me. Maybe it is. The beast shuffles forward, its feet obscured by the force below. With each movement, there's another massive echo. Trees crackle and snap beneath its immense weight like twigs, flattened to nothing and buried under the snowfall. Slowly, the beast lumbers off into the night, and is swallowed from sight by the darkness. Soon, even the sounds of its footsteps fade, too. I'm not sure how long Terra and I remain in petrified silence. 
I realize that I've fallen to my knees, though I have no recollection of it happening. I feel like I have no recollection of anything, that nothing will ever make sense again. At some point, Morgan comes to my side, helping Tara and I back indoors. My whole body is numb with either shock or the cold, perhaps both. She leads us to one of the benches that's mostly intact. I collapse down onto it, my legs still unwilling to support me. I glance at Tara. All the color is gone from her face, and she's still trembling. I probably don't look much better. For a long time, none of us know what to say. We sit and wait and wait until long after the snow has stopped falling and morning arrives. Chapter 2 We are going to save here. And that will be it for tonight. That has been part of the woods. If you enjoyed what you saw here, you should probably pick it up. I'm very excited to continue playing it and figure out this mystery. And next week, for another WL Wednesday, I'll be back with a different game. So take it easy. I'm going to need quite a lot of water. And good night, everybody.